फिर से भेजते सर विनीता विनीता कैन यू सेंड द लिंक टू डॉक्टर सिंघवी वंस अगेन ओके इन द व्हाट्सएप और मेल मेल पे आई गेस इट विल बी बेटर ओके सेंडिंग सेंडिंग सिंघवी इज लॉस्ट एज यू नॉट अ इजी पर्सन टू बी लॉस्ट <laughs> <laughs> There are many ways of thinking about losing it. Absent, <laughs> absent. एक तो पेन में पेन सिग्नेचर किया है हाँ अरे सर गुड मॉर्निंग ओह यू लॉस्ट द लिंक ऑफ़ शर्ट आई जूम सिग्नेचर योर माइक इज़ म्यूट इन फ्रंट ऑफ़ बॉब वॉशन आई एम ऑलवेज़ म्यूटेड या या दैट दिस विल बी अ फर्स्ट गुड टू सी यू बॉब लाइकवाइज़ द शर्क Hmm. So, uh, should we move on? Yes. Now that we have a uh, esteemed guest, Singhvi. <coughs> yeah, it's there. Like, with. Have it. Morning, sir. Morning, Doctor Singhvi. Good morning. Vinita, should we start? Pradeep, maybe you know people are coming in, so can we just wait for two more minutes so that you know uh, when you tell people at ten, so they join at ten, and uh, they will start. Yeah, multiple. Yeah, just admit everybody. Yeah, fifty-five. 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 F
And I can see the senior patron, senior advisor of the association, Professor Vishwas Kale, Dr. Rasik Ravindra, Professor Ashok Karumuri, and the president of the Association of Quarter Researchers, Dr. Ramnath Shah. Colleagues, all the founder members of the association, attendees, ladies and gentlemen. A very good morning and warm welcome to all of you. This is Pradeep Srivastava, Vice President of the association, bringing you the inaugural session of the conference of Indian Quarterly Congress. Friends, the concept of association came into being at Dublin in Goa, and now it is a registered body with more than 200 members as a registered members, fellows. The governing body of association decided to organize Indian Quaternary Congress biennially, and I'm extremely happy that despite of all hard times, here we are with you with the first edition of IQC, and I can see the full galaxy of accomplished quaternary workers are here to witness the event and participate in it. The Congress has received an overwhelming response from all the quarters, and we have 92 research papers to be presented and are classified into five different sessions. Looking forward now, I request Dr. Vanna Prasad, the president of association, to say a few words and formally declare the Congress open. Morning, everybody, and uh, Professor Ashok Kumar Singhvi and uh, Viswas Kale, Robert Vasan, and uh, Rasik Ravindraji, and Pradeep Shavastav, Rajiv Patnaik, and all the quaternary uh, researchers. I welcome you all for today's uh, this conference, which, uh, which is going to be convened today. As we know that the last 2.6 million years in the Earth history is the most recent and ongoing period that witnessed major shifts of climate, such as expansion and contraction of ice sheets, rise and fall of global sea levels, migration and extinction of flora and fauna, evolution and expo exponential rise in the population of human race and abrupt climatic events. So these changes are imprinted on natural proxy records the varied physiographic landscape and climate regime of India provides a variety of quaternary successions in the Himalayas, river and lake deposits of Indo-Gangetic plains in the desert area, quaternary deposits all along the coast as well as marine succession. We have also witnessed various social, agricultural, anthropological events from prehistory to modern. The climatic and geodynamic changes are visible both in their amplitude and magnitude. Along with this climatic and physiographic diversity, India has a large pool of educational institutes, organizations, and universities that are dedicated to scientific research and teaching on all aspects of the quaternary sciences. Keeping this as the dominant thought, it was considered prudent to form an association of quaternary researchers. In the vigor and dynamism of quaternary researchers in the country, especially budding scientists and research scholars under one roof. The main aim of this association is to provide a platform or a springboard in a sense to quaternary researchers to present their noble ideas in quaternary research to the masses. I have used the word springboard with a purpose. The Quaternary Association hopes to encourage its member to use this platform for propagating newer, fresher ideas, leaving behind hackneyed, repetitive ones. Since its inception, this association has held many meetings, lectures, and trainings. I'm sure that should any member wish to hold an online meeting under the auspices of the association, the executive would be happy to look at the proposal on its merits. So today we are very happy to convene the first Indian Quaternary Congress. We have a number of participants, uh, about 41 oral and about 40, 40 uh, post presentation. And I welcome you all again, all the keynote speakers. And I, I hope that this conference is going to be a huge success. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prasad. 
And uh, moving on with your uh, permission, we are here to now welcome Professor Bob Watson, who is going to deliver the first keynote of the Congress. Prince Professor Bob Watson is a sedimentologist and geomorphologist who has significantly contributed to arid zone researches, surface hydrology and extreme events, environmental rehabilitation, river catchment management, and with eye on always on disaster risk reduction, whatever he does. So this is his expertise. Professor Vasan has received PhD from Macquarie University with postdoctoral positions at University of Auckland, Australian National University. He has served Australian National University and CSIRO with reaching to higher positions at Dean Sciences and the head of the institution, the head of the uh, department. And he has served as the Vice Chancellor, Deputy Vice Chancellor Research of Charles Darwin University. Later in 2011, he joined National University of Singapore where he worked in the Asia Research Institute and the Institute of Water Policy at Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. He has done research in Australia, India, New Zealand, Singapore, Indonesia, Timor Leste, Malaysia, Nepal, Pakistan, China, Myanmar, Thailand, and has published more than 250 research articles with citations reaching above 9,000. Friends, it's a great honor that Professor Vasan has accepted our request of, for delivering the keynote of the Congress. I now invite Professor Vasan to please deliver his address. Now, I minimize the screen, Benita. Yes, please share your presentation. Now, can, can, you, see, can you see my presentation? Not yet. Uh, in this, uh, Bob, you'll have to uh, present uh, the oh, again yes, the arrow, the one here. Sorry. <laughs> I, so I yeah. thought I had this worked out, but clearly my memory is not as good as it used to be. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah wonderful. So we now can I see minimize. your screen. Now you can minimize it, the yellow button, and then uh, we see your screen. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and then this would be in the slide mode uh, so that uh, we can see it. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. It's, that's okay like that? Whoops, no, it's not. No, we're okay. seeing it, Bob. Excellent. Pradeep, thank you so much for those introductory words. Dr. Prasad, thank you for your introduction, and thank you all for the invitation to, uh, to talk to you today. It, it, is, it is a wonderful thing that you are doing. And may I say, looking through the program, I am incredibly impressed by the, the range of materials that are on display. Um, as many of you know, Ashok particularly, um, I first began working in India in the mid-Holocene, and uh, the progress in quaternary research in India has been really very impressive. And, uh, and I, I think the program demonstrates that. My talk today will be perhaps different from what you might expect um, in a quaternary meeting, but I, I want to, as I have done for quite a long time, try to demonstrate how quaternary research is, is useful outside the academy to policy and to minimization of risk. And that's what I want to talk about today. My argument is as follows. Long records are needed to understand natural resource degradation, such as soil erosion, salinization, um, to identify triggers, causes, trends, and, and what the background state was before major change occurred. But unfortunately, most of the records we have um, are too short. They're based on the phenomena that I've listed there. They're too short, really, to get trends and to identify, therefore, to identify triggers. For environmental hazards, uh, such as floods and, 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 and so on, um, we also need long records to determine trends, frequency, return periods, etc. Again, we face the problem of the records are too short. And, and so we of course, in the case of earthquakes, we do have paleo seismology, but we'll get to that sort of issue a little later on. So 
given that these traditional methods, river gauging, seismometers, aerial photography, satellite imagery, all of which are valuable, uh, given that these records are too short, we need to use all possible sources of data to produce long records. And, um, and these, the, these sources include studies of the Quaternary. Now, I've included a little photograph here of dancers in Assam, making the point that tradition has its place and is extremely important, but not slavishly in science. We shouldn't stick just to the traditional methods because we are familiar with them. And in fact, of course, a lot of people in the, work, in the field in which I have done work over the years uh, are not familiar with the quaternary methods or quaternary results. And this is, this is an educational issue and a communication issue that we should all take some responsibility for. So let's just think a little bit about what time is in history. You may think this is a, well, time is pretty obvious. There's a clock, it, it passes. Well, there are some views that differ from that. There is a philosophical view called presentism, which the idea that only the present exists. Well, I, I find that I think anybody who works in earth science would find that very hard to, to accept. The eternalist view, which is the one that I think quaternarists would adopt, is that there is both a past and a future. And to think otherwise seems a little bit weird. And the, but the present, what is the present? The present is fleeting. The first part of my talk is now history. It's gone. Sorry, it's not gone. It's, it's there, but it's history. And so to me, everything of importance is history, except the future, which eventually becomes history. And it doesn't take very long for it to become history. And as the quote on the right says, every, history is everything that has ever happened. I think we need to take that on board. It may seem self-evident, but, but maybe it's not to quaternists. Now, Stephen Jay Gould, the paleontologist and evolutionary biologist from Harvard University, uh, wrote a wonderful book called The Arrow of Time. I recommend it. It's, uh, there's a, there's a uh, <clears throat> excuse me, there is a um, scanned version online. It is a remarkable account of two ideas of time, the arrow of time in which there's an irreversible sequence of unrepeatable events, linear time, if you like, or time cycle, where time has no direction, the differences of the past will be realities of the future. Now, it's interesting that geologists, paleontologists think about these sorts of issues and don't seem to have a huge amount of trouble with them. That's maybe because we don't think deeply enough. And with Singh V. Saab in the room, I need to be very careful about physicists because physicists do seem to struggle with this because most physical laws are reversible, except near the Big Bang, it would appear. So there does seem to be a disconnect between the physicist's view of physical laws and how we think. This is an ongoing issue, I think, that uh, for us to wrestle with. And of course, in the diagram on the right, which is pur purports to be CO2 increasing in the atmosphere, it's artificial. But there we've got trend, the arrow of time, and we have cycles. So we can have both together. And I think we, it's worth thinking about these issues in the data sets we produce and analyze. So to me, the quaternary is just another kind of history. And the only data we have are historical. That's all we've got. It's all we will ever have. They are, the data are historical. So the quaternary, documentary, instrumental records are all historical records. So we might think that they are equivalent, but of course they're not. They're not strictly equivalent because of differences of validity, resolution, and accuracy. Documents are produced by people and can be biased by the writer. Lithostratigraphic records are incomplete and stratal thickness and time are nonlinear. And completeness and accuracy are not synonymous. But it's not as if any of these sources of information and data are without problems. But they are all of a kind. They are all historical. And of course, the future can only be known by extrapolation or by modeling or by living long enough. But both approaches require data from the past. 
And so the quaternary fits into that category. Also, I would argue that we need to think about which view of time seems to be most appropriate. So with that rather abstract introduction, I want to turn to the sort of phenomena that, that have interested me on and off um, for the over years. I, I will use some Australian examples, but I will also refer to Indian examples. So in natural resource, and of course the, the hockey stick graph here is perhaps the most famous paleoclimatic example and had huge impact politically. Um, some of it not very good, some of it very negative for the people who produced it. But it is an astonishingly powerful graph showing the rise of temperature um, in the last, since about 1900, um, set in the context of a thousand years. So we need these historical records for the various phenomena that I've listed on the left. And you could probably think of others. So let's take some examples. There's a photograph of a very deep gully, um, which occurs in this particular gully is in southeastern Australia. This is a form of land degradation. There is some evidence that gullies formed before Europeans arrived, but they're very rare. This appears to be a phenomenon of European land use. Is that true? Identifying causes and solutions requires a temporal perspective. When did these gullies start to form? Why did they form? Is there something we can do about them? And also documenting trends in degradation requires a longer than usual perspective. So here is Here's an example of a section in a river creek bank, river bank. Underneath is the SM, the so-called so swampy meadow, which was the surface of the ground when Europeans arrived with cattle and sheep and pigs and so on, goats. And on top of and, and that contains no European artifacts, and it's been dated by OSL. It contains pollen of native species. On top of that is what is called PSA or post-settlement alluvium. It includes European artifacts and has been dated by OSL as well. I'll get to that in a minute. The PSA is a result of deposition downstream of incisions into the swampy meadow material and the underlying Pleistocene sediments. So the PSA would appear to be a response to incision and the incision is a response to European land use. The age of deposition, of PSA deposition, uh, is, is, in a sense, the age of incision, upstream. Here is a section from Paul Rastomji et al. from CSRO's work near Canberra, where they have, they have many, many OSL dates done by Tim Peach. And <clears throat> uh, very quickly, it explains that PSA deposition began about 1900, common era. The swampy meadow is of late Holocene age and the pre-swampy meadow is Pleistocene alluvium. So here we have clear evidence of, of some European impact. And so when we, on the right-hand side, you see a graphical representation of many of these processes. At the bottom is another photograph of the swampy meadow on the left is, a, is a, an unincised valley floor that's what they most of these valley floors look like when europeans arrived indigenous people used these areas they burned them but they didn't cause incision on the right is the same stratigraphy that i mentioned before the swampy meadow and the psa at the top is a diagrammatic representation of that um, where it goes from swampy meadow through to an incised gully but interestingly on the left hand side is um, the sediment delivery ratio, in other words, the proportion of sediment mobilized in the catchment that leaves the catchment. And you can see it's declining. And that implies that the, <clears throat> the, the gullies and channel incisions have been stabilizing. And they will do that by themselves, by negative feedback processes. And so, yes, soil conservation has been applied in this catchment, but in fact, the system will, to some degree, stabilize and sediment yield and sediment delivery will decrease through time. 
So from this, we can conclude that the gullies and channel incision post-date European settlement. We know from a, a range of experiments and observations of local farmers that they were this in, these incisions were caused by grazing and plowing valley floors. And the valley floor on the right is another example of an unincised valley. And so one possible approach to stabilizing these systems is to reestablish the landscape that was there before Europeans arrived. And this is actually happening. And there has some, been some success in this, particularly at a place called Maloon Creek. So the history, <coughs> excuse me, the history, some of which includes quaternary approaches, lithostratigraphy, chronometry, pollen analysis, even simple archaeology and documentary evidence and oral histories of older farmers all come together to provide us with a reason for and an argument for well, what caused it and what can we do about it. And plus, in this particular case, in this place called Jerobomba Creek, uh, where I worked with a colleague from Wadia Institute, um, Mazari, who was um, in Australia for a couple of years on an on a Indian government scholarship, and um, Ram Christian Mazari. And uh, we did a settlement budget for this Jerobomba Creek where we concluded that, and this did not include quaternary stuff, it was really based upon measurements of quantities of sediment moving, that 93% of the sediment from gut was from gullies and channel incision. So again, this is another line of evidence to, along with the quaternary and documentary evidence uh, to suggest a way forward. Plus, not only restoring the swampy meadows, but also fencing out the streams. But what about India? Well, there is some literature on the role of gullies in uh, sediment yields in India, and I think probably Vishwas and others would know more about this than I. Um, the Chumbal gullies, however, are rather interesting in that they appear to be at least 400 years old. They were described by European travelers um, at, that, at that time. And there is a possibility that they're tectonically induced. In other words, the forebulge of the shield of the peninsula um, rising slowly, uh, plus rainfall and probably plus land use uh, has induced major gullying. But interestingly, if, if the Australian experience has anything to go on, and I, I'm now only talking about peninsular India, but gully erosion may well be a major contributor to, for example, sedimentation in reservoirs, which of course reduces the capacity of the reservoir, reduces the usefulness of the reservoir, etc. So we really need to be, uh, we need a lot more to be done on that sort of work. Cyclones and floods. This is a recent image of Australia with a cyclone that was off the coast, just off where we live. They cause large floods, not the only cause of large floods. And the question arises, do cyclones and large floods cluster in time? And if they do, standard risk assessments are not valid. Here's a, a piece of work that um, Ashoka is involved in, yet to be published. A series of sites in Northern Australia, Northern, Northern Territory, where we've compiled data on paleo cyclones and paleo floods. Here's one of the sites, paleo flood analysis from Nitmalung Gorge. Um, this is in a, a flood, nearly flooded season, and I put a little arrow, which is difficult to see where the slack water deposit is located, and a lithostratigraphic and chronology section on the right-hand side. Similarly, for paleocyclone analysis at Casuarina Beach in Darwin, Stephen Garnett standing by a, a stack of storm surge deposits, and again, the dating, etc., on the right-hand side. No time to go into the detail. It's sufficient to say that we, we have a reasonable story here. If we put all of these data together and a fairly simple statistical analysis, because there's not enough data to be very sophisticated, it seems that there are clusters at, at, at those dates, about 1920, 14, 16, 30, 26, 9, 938, common era. So it's about 100 years ago was the last cluster. And pretty much all the gauge data and, of course, all the satellite imagery for uh, um, cyclones is in the last 50, 60, 70 years. And three of those clusters occurred during La Nina-like conditions. 
which is important for the future. So implications of the top end analysis, clusters imply non-stationary series. In other words, the series does not have <clears throat> an approximately constant mean and variance of magnitude or frequency. Standard risk assessment, therefore, is not possible, but it's an input to risk assessment. And it's very interesting that almost all paleo flood records show evidence of non-stationarity. Here's an example from Southern Africa, from the Orange River, not the Orlage River. Now, the 2013 Alexander flood disaster, I had some fascinating discussions with engineers in, in Srinagar about this who tried to argue that that event was unique. Well, of course, if you look at the disaster side of it, the human side of it, the two photographs from a paper by Norish Rana and Adal, uh, you can see the change in uh, over about 100 years in the number of people, the number of buildings, etc. So you get the same event in 100 years ago, you get much less damage than you do now. <clears throat> we did a study some years ago based upon the paleo flood deposits and others, Benswara slack water deposit on the right. And on the left, the most important thing is the graph showing the cumulative number of floods and the bottom panel. That's not a stationary series again. So again, we've got a problem with the standard hydrologic method when we use, when we look at the paleo flood record. More importantly, perhaps the 2013 event was certainly not unique. Now, Pradeep and his, his gang have done some wonderful work in the Siang River in the upper Brahmaputra, and some of their sections are in the left-hand side. Over the last 5,000 years, peak paleo floods have been around about a million cubics, cubic meters per second. This is two orders of magnitude larger than peak gauged monsoon floods. Most recent was about 1,000 years ago. Now, these are huge events by world standards. And how do we prepare for such events? They will happen again. In Thailand, work that Ashok was involved in again, we did a very detailed study of the Ping River. The left-hand panel simply shows that we did a lot of lithostratigraphic work and chronometric work. Uh, a lot of the, most of the OSL was done in Ashok's lab. On the right is a block diagram showing the, that from time to time, this river strips its floodplain. The floodplain is stripped off the channel widens up to 10 times and deepens. And the, uh, hard, the, the B, um, sorry, the, um, the modern channel is shown in the middle and the expanded channel is shown by the, the solid line. Now, these occur, we've, we've dated them approximately to the dates that are given there. The 1831 date is the best known. There's at least three in that time period, about a thousand years. There may be one much earlier as well, much more poorly known. When this happens again, I say when, not if. This is going to be devastating. Here's how the Thai people deal with floods at the moment. One way, they, they boat around. But with these floodplain stripping events, most of the infrastructure on the floodplain, which is immense, would be destroyed with a lot of loss of life. So the conclusions from this are long records based upon all the information we can accumulate allow us to identify causes, identify trends, and find solutions. For paleo floods and paleo cyclones, evidence of non-uniqueness, clusters, non-stationarity again, which raises all sorts of statistical issues um, for analysis. Mega floods raise the question of preparation. There's very large floods in the Siang River, Upper Brahmaputra, and in Thailand, and there are many other examples. Can we really prepare for them? And I have to say, none of these is either linear or cyclic in the sense of Gould. And I'm going to end on a, on a rather tricky note. Economists like to discount expenditure for disasters. So the, the argument goes like this. You spend money now to reduce the costs of future large disasters, which produces benefits in the distant future. Well, maybe it's in the distant future. We don't know. It could be tomorrow. But 
statistically, it could be in the, in the distant future. Therefore, the policy trade-off depends on whether these future benefits are discounted at a substantial rate, such as the 5 to 6% that is usually applied, or at the near zero social rate. Um, the UK's um, Stern report on climate change uses the near zero social rate. Therefore, the standard economic approach is to cost the cost of infrequent large hydro hydroclimatic events, such as the event a thousand years ago in this young river, just disappear at high discount rates. You don't, there's no point in expending money to try to mitigate such an event because of the discount rate. So funds are allocated to mitigating smaller, more frequent events. That may be thoroughly rational. But even can we even mitigate mega floods of the kind that I described from the Xiang and from um, Thailand? And it seems to me that quaternaries need to engage with these questions if they are to get involved in the sort of work that I'm talking about. So Pradeep, I think I will end it there. And if there's any time, try to take deal with questions. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Professor Vasan. Uh, and yes, we have time to take few questions and 10 minutes for discussions. I'll request uh, speakers or attendees. Uh, Pradeep, there is a question in the chat box, if you can, uh, Robert, if you can take it. I'm trying to get out of this. How do I get out of this darn thing? Uh, okay. Just, uh, yeah, minimize. Go to the main screen and stop presenting. Yeah. Uh, now you have to get to the... Uh, uh, okay. Stop okay. presenting. Yeah. Stop the, presenting. The blue button. Right. Okay. Thank you. I request everyone to please switch off or mute your mic. Except the speaker. Uh, there's a question by uh, Mr. Okay. Sharia. Now, oh, yes. we have time for, for a few questions. I have to say to, uh, to Dr. Bhattacharya, uh, please send me an email, wasson.robertj at gmail.com. Right, right. Thank you. It was a comment, not a question. Sorry for the confusion. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's That sounds really interesting. Yes, we have been trying to measure, um, you know, use family reservoirs in peninsular India to understand the impact of uh, both grid droughts as well as um, floods. Yes. In and 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 sort of lakes are aggregators so this is something that is uh, currently under revision but i'm happy to talk to you about it yeah great excellent rajesh professor Vasan, i um i just want to know your opinion on um, one very important issue here uh, as your uh, keynote address which was ex uh, exactly focusing on that I mean, people start saying, I'm just trying to say from the other side of the table, that we know we have enough data in quaternary sometime, and uh, we know that the climate is variable, but uh, quaternary, for the quaternary scientist, uh, the question is, what can you guys do about the mitigations? So what is your outtake about the climate change mitigations for quaternary scientists? Well, uh, look, Rajesh, good to see you again. Um, I, um, I think it, mitigation is a specialist business, and I, I don't think quaternarists by themselves, unless they are particularly multi-skilled, can do very much about it. Um, it I, I would suggest teaming up with people who are expert in this. Um, now, I've recently, um, because, of, because of where I was at the National University of Singapore, I was working with a lot of policy people and economists, and, and we published a paper a little while ago looking at um, floods in Assam, um, uh, not from a quaternary perspective, looking at the gauge data and the, um, 
uh, the embankments. And we really couldn't see any evidence for uh, a, a, a positive effect of the embankments. In fact, the embankments are causing problems. But there is a quaternary aspect to this which Pradeep and I have discussed, and <clears throat> he made a start on it, but um, uh, we need to discuss it again. Um, one of the things that embankments may well do is to starve floodplains of sediment. And in the case of the Brahmaputra, the bed of the river is rising because of a, a flux of sediment, mainly from the syntaxis, um, which, you know, the erosion rates in there are phenomenal. Um, and the bed of the river will continue to rise and the floodplain may not. In other words, the bed of the river may well rise above the floodplain. And the quaternary side of this is to get information about the rate of sedimentation on the floodplain, which Pradeep has made a start on. Um, and, and it's very hard to get it from the channel itself yeah. other than by monitoring. But that, that's an input to mitigation. It's not mitigation itself. But what it does is to say to the engineers, look, your current approach may not be the best approach because you may actually be causing more problems than you're solving. Yes. So I think it's, it's, it's a matter of working with engineers, economists, hydrologists, um, <clears throat> and people who think about natural solutions to um, flood, flood mitigation. I'm, I'm just talking about floods because that's what I mainly work on now. Um, now, for example, embankments do cause a lot of problems. Um, and maybe we need better zoning, better planning of buildings, better, better main, um, in, enforcing the building code, all sorts of things other than what Coturnus might think about. But if you're going to get into this business, form a team, work with other people. Thank you. Thank and you. I think the same, I'm sorry, Rajesh, I think the same is true for climate change mitigation, yes. just as it is for flood mitigation, or indeed earthquake mitigation. It's essentially the same story. Yeah. Okay. In the, there are a few questions in the chat box. Pradeep, you are the only... Ah, yes, right. What is so the, the best chat proxy box? for reconstructing paleocyclonic events? Yeah, good question. Um, the um, and I, I'm going to leave cloudburst to other people. Uh, this is from Thomas Harris. Wow, that's an interesting name. I I won't try that one. Um, paleocyclonic events uh, on the coast produce storm surges, um, but you've got to be careful, and they produce depositional records. Um, You've got to be careful to disentangle them from paleo tsunami events. And the site we've looked at in Northern Australia, um, it's protected from tsunami. But in other places, such as the coast of India, that may not be the case. And a question from Mordecai. Greetings, Mordecai. Yeah, mathematicians are physicists who invent new types of analyses to do our analysis. Interesting question. The, the hydrologists have, have come up with all sorts of weird and wonderful ideas to, to try to deal with this, um, including slicing the time series into very short pieces until they are stationary. And then you have very, very little data to work with. I don't think that's the, uh, I don't think that's the solution. Um, so I, you know, I, I would much rather somebody with more mathematical ability than me to work on this. And also Mordecai, what do you think our near future. Not sure what you mean, Mordecai. Huh. I mean, uh, when we try to predict for the future, right? I mean, how much future we have to, like 50 years or 100 years? Oh, how far into the future? Ah, yes, thank you. Um, oh, gosh. Um, I mean, I, you know, th there are many ways of approaching this. One of probabilistic, which is essentially the hydrologic method. Um, I would rather take the, um, the view that these very large events, such as the one that Pradeep and his team have identified and we've identified in Thailand and many other people have done, take the view that that is something that can happen again. And we don't know when, um, but we should, we should investigate the possibility of mitigation. Um, and for example, in the Siang, I mean, some of the work that um, Pradeep has published is just terrifying. 
what those large events would do once the water got down beyond Pasigat and onto the plain. It's absolutely terrifying what would happen. I don't think anybody knows about that, but, it, but please tell me I'm wrong. Uh, do the engineers in Dibraga know that there is a flood that big that could wipe out Dibraga? Yeah, I think your message is very well taken that quaternary geologists and engineers should more often fight. And uh, we should, should more spend, often fight. More often fight together. <laughs> and Not we together. Spend more money on, on planning. Yes, yeah, everything exactly. has a price tag. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think if there are not, I mean, any more questions, we need to move on with the session. And uh, on behalf of AUQR and the President INCOA and all the attendees and founder members, I sincerely thank Professor Robert Wasson for his really insightful talk and sharing all his experience and uh, bringing in his uh, wisdom to to see to see how how a quaternary geologist can really be helpful in planning and mitigation and disaster risk reduction thank you so much sir thank you pradeep so uh, friends now it's time to move on with the presentations uh, session 1 session 1 will be moderated by myself and my colleague dr rajesh agniotri from birbal sahani institute of Techno birbal sahani institute of Paleo sciences and I'm told that the first talk of this session uh, is uh, B.S. Kotlia is not presenting the talk. I would request, and it's almost about the time that uh, we can start with the second presentation. Is Mohammad Tariq has joined? Mohammad Tariq? Okay, so Mohammad Tariq will be presenting on boron isotope based pH record of last three decades from Arabian Sea coral records. Mohammed, please. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's visible. Yeah, yeah. It's visible. Okay. Hi. Good morning, everybody. So I'm Mohammad Tariq. Uh, currently, I'm a PhD student at NCPR Goa, uh, working under the guidance of Dr. Valio Rahman. So uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, work which recently got published in uh, JGR Biogeosciences. So uh, in this study, we have generated the pH record from the Arabian Sea. So uh, 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 we have already seen this uh, graph in this uh, in our previous talk. So so this is the instrumental record. Uh, here we can see the atmospheric uh, CO2 as well as uh, dissolved CO2 concentration, this second line. And, and this bottom one represents the instrumental record of ocean pH. So what we can see, due to continuous increase in atmospheric CO2, there is increase in CO2 concentration of the seawater, as well as there is a decrease in the seawater pH. So this decrease in pH is called ocean acidification. So the chemistry of this is quite simple. What will happen when the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere will increase? more CO2 will be dissolved in water and it will react with water to form a carbonic acid. So it's a weak acid and it will dissociate to form bicarbonate ion and hydrogen ion. So uh, uh, we can notice here that there is an increase in the hydrogen ion concentration of the ocean, uh, which is also, uh, we can say that there is an increase in the acidity of the ocean or decrease in the pH. So which is acidification. So if you see a bigger picture, so this, this is the uh, atmospheric CO2 concentration reconstructed from the Antarctic ice core. And we can see in the last 800,000 years, the CO2 concentration was never higher than 300 ppm. But after this industrial revolution, in just 200 years, the CO2 concentration has reached to a value of around 415 ppm. And the model projection shows that 
uh, this will reach to a value somewhere around 800 ppm and and why should we care about this because uh, this this ocean ph will reach to a value of around 7.7 .7, uh, and and this due to this uh, this lots of marine organism it will become difficult for organism marine organism to form their shell and it will also accelerate the dissolution of their shells so here these instrumental records are available only for a very small time so if you want to go back in time uh, so re to reconstruct the past pH record, we need two things. Uh, this first one is an archive, that is a material from which we can extract the past information. So for that, I'm using this uh, boron isotopic composition, and and for uh, uh, and for using corals, and for uh, using a geochemical method, which is using boron isotopic composition to reconstruct the pH. So boron has two naturally occurring stable isotopes, 11 and 10 boron, and its isotopic ratio is represented uh, in the form of uh, delta notation, which is basically uh, isotopic composition of the sample divided by a standard minus one into 1000. And in ocean, this boron exists in the form of two compounds, that's boric acid and boratine. So these two are related to each other by a reaction, which involves hydrogen ion concentration, that means pH. So the abundance of these two compounds depends on pH. We can see this is the relative proportion and, and these two compounds uh, basically vary with the uh, pH. And one more thing uh, which we can notice here, this isotopic composition of these two compounds also varies with pH. So what happened when the marine organisms like forans and coral, they form their shell, they preferentially incorporate only this BH4 minus ion. So from the, boron, uh, from the measurement of boron isotopic composition of these shells, we can reconstruct the pH of the ocean and which can be estimated uh, using this simple equation. And if you see the available record of boron isotope uh, using corals, so most of these records are uh, available only from the Pacific, few records are available from the Atlantic Ocean, and, and from Indian Ocean, we, uh, there is no record available from this whole ocean. So uh, we decided to reconstruct pH from the uh, Arabian Sea, and, and, uh, one, uh, and we have selected this uh, Lakshadweep, uh, and we have uh, this this Lakshadweep region. The one of the reason for selecting this site is that uh, if we see uh, this this bottom panel represent the uh, SST during winter and summer monsoon, and we can see there is large reversal or change in the wind pattern, as well as reversal in the surface circulation, and uh, there are also changes in the upwelling and and biological productivity during these seasons. So this is a, a highly dynamic region. So if you want to understand how different processes influence the pH, so this is an ideal site. So this is our uh, boron isotope record as well as pH. So left uh, hand side y axis represents the boron isotopic composition, and right hand side y axis represents so uh, and and these bottoms are other proxies for uh, uh, the, which is carbon isotope and and these are proxies for temperature and this is El Nino. So few things we can notice here is that there is a large variation in the pH record, uh, 0.3 to 0.4 units. And other than that, there is no significant declining trend which we are expecting from the atmosphere increase in the atmospheric CO2 concentration. And and these blue la blue bands represent the uh, La Nina condition and red bands represent El Nino condition. So during La Nina, we are uh, seeing a lower pH and while El Nino, we are seeing a higher pH. So, and uh, one more thing, if you see the 13th record, we are not also not seeing any significant declining trend. So to explain that, if you see, this is the uh, carbon isotopic composition from the Antarctic uh, 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 yeah, carbon isotopic composition of the CO2 reconstructed from the Antarctic ice core. And we can see this significant declining trend, uh, which is due to a uh, burning of fossil fuel because uh, these fossil fuels are uh, enriched in 12 carbon. That's why, that, that's why we are seeing a declining trend. And the same trend is observed in the coral record from across the globe. Okay, so this is called Seuss effects. If in our case, this declining, uh, this thing uh, would be dominantly controlled by the global CO2 signature. So we, we are expecting a, a declining trend in 13C as well as ocean pH, we are, which we are not getting. That means that this, uh, at our study site, this, uh, this pH variability uh, uh, can be dominantly controlled by the regional uh, process or basin scale process compared to this global CO2 forcing. 
So to understand why uh, this is happening, so we first try to understand whether there is an influence of El Nino at our site. So this is El Nino composite SST anomaly, which shows a strong positive correlation. So which shows that our study area is influenced by El Nino. And then if we, this is the uh, vertical uh, profile of pH during El Nino and La Nina period, and we can see this is our study site. And uh, we can see there is a large pH gradient in the top 50 to 100 meter. So therefore, the, if there is a large, slight change in the upwelling or mixed layer depth, that will have a large influence on the pH variability. And, and uh, that's why we are getting a large variability. Other than that, if you see the nutrient content, there is also large variation during the El Nino and La Nina period. So this we can explain using this schematics. So uh, during El Nino, there is a stratification due to which uh, there is a decrease in the mixed layer depth as well as upwelling. And this, uh, due to which uh, there will be a, a decrease in the upwelling of CO2 rich or low pH water. So uh, similarly, which will be reversed in case of La Nina. And, and uh, from our study, we have shown that this uh, this physical parameter, basically this upwelling and mixed layer depth are dominant factor, which are uh, responsible for large pH variability at our study area. So uh, some of the major uh, conclusions from this study are, this is the uh, first pH record uh, from 1990 to 2013 from the Indian Ocean. And, and we are not seeing any long-term declining trend in the pH, which is ocean acidification because of large surface pH variability in the Arabian Sea. Uh, other than that, El Nino modulated physical uh, processes are dominant factor which are responsible for this variability. And other than that, this model projection shows that there will be increase in the P, uh, this uh, El Nino intensity and therefore we are expecting an increase in the pH extreme, uh, which is critical for the uh, this uh, marine organisms. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. It was a nice presentation. And we can we have time to for two quick questions. One is there in the chat box from Anil Kumar. What will happen more on if water is acidic in nature? So uh, as I have shown that the uh, boron in seawater it exists in the form of two species boric acid and boric ion so what will happen in uh, we can see from the presentation so out of these two species at lower ph uh, this uh, at lower ph this is the low ph and this is 100% BH4 minus. So this abundance of these two species will shift. So at lower pH, this both BH3 minus will be dominant. If we keep on increasing the pH, the other species will continue dominating. So only this abundance of these two species will change. What is the correlation between ENSO and Lakshadweep pH? Does Indian Ocean Diapole has effect on Lakshadweep pH? Yeah, this is a good question. Uh, actually, due to time constraint, I didn't discuss that. So uh, uh, since uh, in our study, what we did, uh, this El Nino has a periodicity, uh, which varies between, uh, 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 that is, two to eight years. Similarly, this IOD also has a similar periodicity. So uh, what we did, we tried to, uh, we have estimated the periodicity in our record, uh, this uh, this boron isotope record, as well as determine the periodicity of ENSO and IOD. So our record shows a periodicity of around seven uh, 7.8 years. Uh, and and which is very much similar to the El Nino. And uh, this is uh, not showing a similar periodicity uh, uh, in that uh, that thing, IOD. And also the wavelet we did to determine what were the time period when these periodicities were dominant. So our boron periodicity was matching very much with the El Nino. So we have suggested that this is due to the dominant influence of El Nino rather than IOD. All right, uh, Mohammed, this is uh, the time you had. And th I thank you for managing your talk well in time. So and you I request you to please and share your screen. So Pradeep, uh, is there any time just to, uh, I mean, uh, okay. Just tell something? Okay. Yes. It is uh, uh, Yes, Mr. Tariq. Uh, so first of all, I congratulate you for your nice work and you are working on the new proxy. But, uh, you know, as the question has already been asked, you know, this is the area that which is uh, 
which is strongly influenced you know by the bare bangal water it comes you know uh, yes. you see during the, um, uh, the later phase later phase of the summer monsoon so uh, you are correlating with the el nino and enso like events so you need to be very careful because uh, once you have the more and more and more water it comes from the bare bangal the fresh water and your site uh, is located in a such a region that uh, you know the surface water will be more stratified yes sir. this is the one thing and the second point is that are you are you really very sure that this is a upwelling area because you are relating with the upwelling and the non upwelling uh, you see the non upwelling season so these are the two points you need to uh, you need to have uh, you know in your mind that while you are interpreting your record okay Okay, Mohammad, you need to get in touch with A.D. Singh Sahib on this. Okay. I mean, there is no need to respond right away. So I thank you for your presentation. Okay, thank you, sir. And uh, moving on, the next next presentation is uh, Fanindra ready? Is there? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Okay, Fanindra, please share your presentation. Fanindra will be presenting the mean monsoon climate shift at the edge of Roman warm period. Excellent. Please share your presentation. <clears throat> Is it visible my screen? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Hello everyone. I am Fanindra Reddy, a final year PhD student at uh, Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, Pune. Uh, I am doing my PhD under the guidance of Dr. Naveen Gandhi. Uh, to better understand the past monsoon variability, we have collected two stalagmites from the Kadapa Cave region. Kadapa Cave, uh, the location is sh uh, shown in the white star on the map. And uh, monthly climatological uh, rainfall values around the cave region suggest that the more uh, th that uh, more than eighty percent of the annual rainfall at this location is. Uh, uh, contributed by summer monsoon rainfall and the moisture source during rainy season is drawn from the Arabian Sea. So this is a, one of the ideal location for studying the monsoon rainfall variability. So in this uh, time series plot, this is a oxygen isotopic variation of the two stalagmites that were collected from uh, Kadapa cave. Um, as we see that at the edge of the Roman warm period around uh, 1800 years uh, uh, six, 1800 to 1600 years, we see a, a shift in the mean monsoon climate. And this proxy, as I shown that the more negative values are the wet in, uh, wetter monsoon, uh, uh, wetter monsoon and uh, less negative is a drier monsoon. So uh, we would like to examine that, is it related to cave processes or real climate, is it a real climate signal? We have validated our monsoon record with the available monsoon proxy records around the subcontinent and uh, observed that the mean monsoon climate has shifted uh, uh, at, at the edge of the Roman warm period. As we see that uh, uh, the, uh, the first panel is uh, uh, the Kadapa uh, stalagmite composite of the two stalagmites and the second uh, uh, panel is Western Bay of Bengal uh, car uh, carbon isotopic data from the Godavari Basin and uh, Northern Arabian Sea water thickness data and, and uh, Baratanga uh, uh, Island uh, cave, uh, cave record. So as we see around this period, uh, 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 there is a declining uh, trend in the monsoon till the edge of the Roman warm period and a sudden shift in the monsoon climate is noticed from uh, all the proxy records. Which was which was which was also noticed from the Guptevsar sample as well as uh, uh, Munugamanu samples from the southern India. So uh, we we tried uh, um, further. It is also note, noted uh, that the Indian monsoon record shown such shifts in the past, uh, uh, sudden abrupt shifts in the mean climate changes from the uh, Mumi cave data, and. Uh, Cheng Hai in, in his paper discussed that uh, abrupt changes in the climate system uh, can occur uh, within a decade also. 
so uh, these are the potential monsoon forcings uh, that can uh, uh, shift the monsoon variability or a mean monsoon climate orbital induced orbital parameters uh, solar activity greenhouse gases and volcanic eruptions north atlantic temperatures tropical indian ocean temperature sorry sorry tropical indian ocean temperatures and tropical pacific temperatures and the cross equatorial flow the strength of the cross equatorial flow in this figure uh, we have shown that the indian monsoon during last 5 millennia with global forcings the top panel is uh, monsoon variability with solar insulation at 30 degree north second panel is the temperature anomalies from the corals re reconstructed from corals uh, from the western coast of uh, sumatra island which are indicative of iod phases and the third panel is the volcanism and these are greenhouse gases concentration and north atlantic temperatures and bond events el nino southern oscillation activity like el nino events and la nina events as we as we notice that the monsoon climate uh, sorry monsoon was uh, continually declining in response with the solar insulation uh but uh, at the uh, at the edge of the at the edge of the roman warm period we we have noticed a, a shift in the uh, mean monsoon climate there, there are no significant uh, 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 volcanism activities uh, around this period uh, the uh, volcanic forcing uh, and there is no solar activity uh, changes also and we notice that uh, the positive iod mean like state at this period and uh, uh, further uh, there is an increase of uh, el, nino, el nino and la nina activities at the same period and there is an exponential increase of uh, uh, greenhouse gases uh, from 5000 years onwards so uh, uh, we we also seen that uh, th this this uh, uh, this shift is occurred around uh, uh, when the solar uh, minima is uh, presently we are in the solar minima uh, values so during last 35000 years we uh, we seen that uh, 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 last glacial maxima where there is a solar minima and presently we are also in solar minima and uh, there is another solar maxima at this period and we noticed that they, there there are uh, uh, abrupt shift in the monsoon uh, uh, both both the uh, solar minima as, uh, uh, solar minimas so uh, the, this is the temperature uh, uh, from the eastern equatorial indian ocean uh, off coast of uh, uh, java uh, islands and uh, wherever the Uh, whenever the temperature is higher which is coinciding with the uh, dry monsoon events and when there is a uh, less temperature cooler temperatures and we notice a, a, a increase in the monsoon intensity and which is uh, uh, which is nothing but the, these are uh, the positive iod mean like state in the last glacial maximum also noticed so uh, we uh, we we Uh, try to explain the atmospheric uh, 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 phenomena circulation using atmospheric circulation phenomena during the positive iod phase uh, there is an anomalous walker cell and uh, hartley cell uh, and there is a strong equatorial uh, cross equatorial flow which favors the monsoon so during a positive iod phase so we we are confident to say that uh, Uh, mean monsoon climate shifted at the edge of the roman warm period which is uh, evident from uh, several monsoon proxy records around the subcontinent and such shifts are observed during uh, each solar minima and maxima uh, during last glacial maximum uh, positive iod like mean state prevailed and coinciding with the enhanced monsoon uh, similarly around the edge of the roman warm period positive iod mean state is prevailed and favor the mean monsoon climate to shift a linear response of the monsoon is observed uh, during uh, each solar minima to the internal forcings like uh, oceanic forcings so uh, 
though the solar forcing remains the primary driver of the long term monsoon variations uh, internal forcing such as uh, ocean forcing like iod uh, intensification may dominate and dictate the monsoon variability thank you okay okay friend thank you so much we have one minute for a quick question is there any question okay dr karamuri please yeah pelinda it's a nice talk uh, yeah. i just wanted to know what uh, uh, sample what proxy you took for enso reports what proxy for for enso you must have mentioned it but i missed it yeah, yeah. this is from moy moy at all data red color intensity data i see moy 2002 okay good you might also want to see the not only the el nino in the nino ocean dipole but the slow changes in them there are decadal variants of uh, enzos and uh, iods what are proxy data you have they may be having signatures of pacific decadal oscillation in the nino ocean dipole but in signal itself is there in anyway those are other part is complicated you can just see that and also think of uh, doing some model output analysis yeah sure sir thank you sir thank you dr ashok i mean fanindra you can take uh, get in touch with dr ashok karumuri through email sure, and i thank you for your presentation please uh, unshare your screen thank you sir now we move on to the fourth presentation dipanvita is there yes sir i'm here okay great uh, dipanvita will be presenting variability of indian summer monsoon strength in northeastern india in past 3 millennium millennium dipan with a please share your screen yes sir great okay so is my uh, ppt visible yes please go ahead okay uh, good morning i am dipanita sengupta an srf working in the wadi institute of himalayan geology i will be talking about the variability of the indian summer monsoon in north in india the past 3 millennia and also uh, how the indian summer monsoon varies in space and time in the past and also in the recent times so this will be the outline of the presentation i have been introducing uh, uh, the study area and objectives and the how ism has varied in space and time and uh, 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 how i have uh, age model the sample and the study results uh, so the indian summer monsoon uh, is a highly variable ocean climate coupled phenomena and uh, uh, it uh, affects pretty much the habitation uh, the livelihood of the people and the uh, pattern of uh, civilization in the indian subcontinent in this figure i have shown how the indian summer monsoon works so the itcz shifts northwards in the boreal summer creating a low pressure it attracts attract, the uh, moisture laden winds from the oceans and the, that is how the southwest uh, monsoon works in the summer time so uh, the motive of this uh, uh, work is to add to the inventory of the holocene records of ism because it is but fragmented so we are trying to add more uh, ism variability records in the holocene so in this study i have uh, chosen a uh, stalagmite from the northeastern india uh, which captures the variability of the indian summer monsoon and also how uh, the ism is related to different climatic uh, phenomena from across the world uh, related to all the teleconnections and how uh, the ism has affect the socio economic uh, uh, behavior of the subcontinent uh, so in this figure you can see uh, the past 200 years uh, Uh, record of the indian summer monsoon that is a uh, very recent time so it you can see that uh, the indian summer monsoon varies quite much in space and time so uh, these records show 31 year average z scores from different uh, regions of india and uh, it is clearly visible that the uh, intensity of the ism is not same uh, in all uh, the places of india and different forcing factors affect it also during the inter holocene the ism has quite much varied and uh, from different regions it it is uh, it has not been the same so uh, my study area is the momlu cave in the northeastern india it is in uh, situated in the uh, east khasi hills in the shillong in the southern part of the shillong plateau and it is uh, 
It receives about 2,600 uh, millimeter of rainfall per year, and the rainfall is distinctly seasonal. Uh, about 70% uh, about of the rainfall is concentrated in the monsoon months. So it is a good place to study the variability of the ISM. <clears throat> so uh, in this, uh, 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 this figure shows the age model of my sample. So it spans from uh, uh, 1,000 calibrated years BP to 3.9 calibrated years BP. And it, is, uh, it can be seen that in the initial and the final stages of the uh, stalagmite growth, uh, the growth rate was quite high uh, in com uh, compared to the uh, middle uh, part of the uh, sample. Coming to the study results, so this is a 23 centimeter long stalagmite sample from the Momlu cave. And uh, <clears throat> uh, in the uh, blue, blue curve shows uh, the oxygen isotope variation of the sample uh, at, as uh, the samples have been collected from the central axis of the sample at 0.5 millimeter interval and measured in the IRMS. And the green curve shows the uh, delta 13C or the carbon isotope variation uh, along the length of the sample. Uh, so it, it, is all, it can also be seen that uh, during the initial uh, and the uh, final part of the uh, uh, growth of the sample, the ISM uh, shows stronger uh, the ISM was strong because it shows more the negative oxygen isotope values compared to the uh, middle parts where uh, uh, the ISM, uh, where the oxygen isotope shows uh, uh, less negative values, indicating uh, less intense ISM during that period. So uh, it is uh, the growth rate of the uh, sample and the strength of the ISM is also coherent, we can say from this. So uh, this part uh, 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 from around 2.9 uh, to 3.2 uh, uh, kilo years before present, this part coincides with the minimum warm period. And it was a warm period and the ISM was strong during that time and it also coincides with the flourishing of the Vedic civilization in India. And uh, during the uh, around 1.1 to 1.4 kilo year before present, this period also shows a, a, a stronger ISM phase here. However, this phase coincides with the dark ages cold period, but uh, uh, this study shows that the uh, climatic forcings it is, uh, is not uniform in all parts of the world and some local phenomena also affects the ISM strength, such as the uh, happening of the uh, Indian Ocean Dipole. And uh, other studies have also shown that, uh, shown that during this time there was a uh, up upwelling in the Arabian Sea of the G. Buloides, which also indicates that there was st stronger ISM during this uh, during this time. <clears throat> so uh, uh, this is what to uh, say that the uh, in the summer monsoon is a highly variable phenomena, and uh, uh, it, it uh, uh, has uh, varied quite much in space and time in the past and the present, and uh, the climatic forcings. Uh, has affected the uh, Indian summer monsoon in different ways and it is not necessarily uniform and we are still developing this study with improved age models and uh, uh, that was uh, thank you for your patience that was all for today's talk thank you Dipanvita and uh, we have two minutes for two questions the first question I already see in the chat box the question is, when does cave carbonate precipitation is maximum in Mahmulu, whether it is during winters or it is summer? Uh, the uh, carbonate precipitation is, uh, <clears throat> is maximum during the summer time, during the summer monsoon, because uh, the uh, the uh, non-monsoon ones are dry. It is, the rainfall is quite seasonal in uh, the uh, northeastern region. I um, I have one question here uh, because a yes. lot of people are working from northeast region on the cave uh, deposits. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, very, uh, very simple. But uh, if you if you can address that, uh, my question is the kind of I mean the magnitude of the delta T no change which you see, let's say from four point two to three point nine. Hmm. Um, have you tried to see it in the real time data, like collecting the 
rainfall, how much delta if you know in terms of millimeter of rainfall it corresponds to? Uh, no, sir, I have not tried, but it's a good suggestion. Okay. All right. Now we can have a question from Dr. Ashok Karmuri. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, 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 Dipanvita, uh, uh, it's a nice talk. Uh, thank you. As far as uh, I'm concerned, I'm a layman as far as your paleo modeling, paleo proxy analysis is concerned. But one thing is northeast monsoon relationship with the rest of the rain monsoon rainfall over India is not so strong. You know, it's actually, not strong. if you take the top mode, they mm -hmm. become as opposite, opposite mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. not necessarily every time. There is a disconnect. And yes. in our analysis of the model outputs, a few models, for last millennium, at least, there is not much change in the northeast monsoon rainfall. I mean, summer monsoon or northeast India, unlike other places. I suspect there's a problem with the models also. My question is, have you compared these, your results with the uh, places, other proxy data from northeast? I mean, and also places around India. That uh, yes, I... Right. Yes, yes, I, I have compared and even from the same cave, the other samples do not match. Okay. Uh, even the, yeah. about the rainfall signals from other places in India? Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I uh, have, yes, I have, I have, I have, I, I have compared, I, I, but I haven't found any uh, uh, very, very good match with the, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, Naveen, now we are short of time. Yeah, yeah. So, probably I request you to please uh, yeah, please yeah. correspond to Deepanvita through email. Thank you. Deepanvita, you can unshare your screen. Okay, sir. The next presentation will be Sumit Sangwal. Sumit, Sumit are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm okay, present. Sumit, great. Please share your presentation. Sumit will be presenting late Holocene lake level fluctuations and hydrodynamics of larger lakes from Trans Himalayas since 33K. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, my name is Sumit Sagwal, SRF at Wadi Institute of Himalayan Geology. I am going to represent the late Holocene lake level fluctuation and hydrodynamics of larger lakes from Trans Himalaya since 3 kilo year. Uh, the outline of my presentation will be the introduction to the problem, uh, why we use the lake delta of the arid Himalaya, my objectives, study area, methodology adopted, and inferences. Uh, as you know, the geomorphological evolution of landscape of any region mainly depends upon the climate tectonic interaction and the surfaces, pro surface processes occurring there. Uh, if we talk about uh, especially about the uh, Himalaya, Himalaya, Himalayan region. Uh, Himalaya, the Northwest Himalaya receives precipitation mainly from two sources, that is in summer from Indian summer monsoon, which carried moisture uh, from westerly driven disturbances, uh, in, uh, which carried moisture from Arabian Sea and uh, Bay of Bengal. And uh, second, in winter from the westerly driven disturbances which carried out moisture from the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, throughout the Himalaya we can see two high precipitation lines. Uh, one is near to the HFT and second is near to the MCT. These uh, high precipitation regions are owing to the uh, sudden increase in altitude which is known as uh, the uh, orographic barrier. Uh, due to this orographic barrier despite of the extension of ITSZ to 34 or 35 degree uh, latitude, uh, there is very few precipitation in this trans Himalayan region that is less than 0 0.5 meter per year. Uh, due to this uh, uh, very few precipitation or less precipitation region, it is known as the cold uh, desert region of uh, India. Uh, in this region, the main ge geomorphological features are the glacial moraines, uh, fluvial terraces, larger lakes, and uh, paleo-lake deposits. Uh, out of which, the fluvial terraces, glacial moraines, and uh, uh, paleo-lake deposits are been, being extensively studied um, by geologists to establish the past climatic shifts uh, occurred during uh, uh, quaternary time period. But larger lakes, 
in case of larger lake there is gap in literature regarding the hydrological changes and lake level fluctuation histories of the larger lakes uh, during the quaternary time frame uh, to study the hydrological uh, changes uh, will provide us uh, about uh, when we see the scenario of global warming when uh, higher himalayas of himalaya and Tibetan plateau are expected to warm dramatically. It is important to, to understand how these lakes may behave. Therefore, the reconstruction of the lake record of, uh, of lake records for their fluctuation, their hydrological change can provide us uh, about the uh, base for the modeling of uh, futures or, uh, in this climatic changes uh, ph phenomena. Uh, to study this set objective, we concentrated our study on the Pangong So, uh, one of the large, one of the largest lake in in, in the Trans Himalayan region. Uh, this uh, Pangong So is a saline lake situated in Pangong stand of uh, the Karakoram Fault and receives melt water from the numerous streams uh, from its uh, catchment. Uh, and there is no outlet to the lake. Uh, due to due to this, uh, consequently, the lake has quite higher salinity. And uh, the periphery of the lake uh, have beautiful classical Gilbert type of delta, uh, which are exposed by the incision of the peripheral streams. These, these lake deltas have a thin flat laying bottom set uh, that are being deposited in deeper um, water condition. Uh, four set, delta -like four set, these are wedge shape uh, deposition uh, during the progradation phase of um, the deltas and uh, uh, relatively thin and flat laying top set of uh, top, top set of delta that are being deposited uh, in shallow marine condition and uh, uh, shows as the paleo shore line uh, condition. So have four more minutes to go. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, to to define uh, to achieve the objectives, we adopted the methodology, uh, the sedimentological and geomorphological evolution, the chronology established by optical stimulated luminescence te techniques, cryochronology, stable isotope analysis of lake and periphery streams, and uh, we used one biological proxy, the diet population. Uh, to establish, uh, to add, uh, we identified four sections of deltaic deposit in the periphery of lake, which extend up to 600 meters uh, from from the lake, and attain maximum height of six meters uh, present from the present day lake, lake level and. Uh, these delta sections have gastropod bearing layers. Uh, we 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 had taken the sample of uh, uh, for set of these lake delta for establishing the chronology and uh, uh, the gastropod cell samples for screenochronological analysis. The chronological chronology is established by using the OSL dating technique on the quartz grain in sample we. We have a dull signal we use the k files for uh, grains for the dating purpose while dating uh, while dating the k files pass uh, we encountered the problem of fading signal for which we carried out the fading correction uh, in k files bar uh, for on the uh, collected gastropod cells we carried out this cranochronological analysis uh, on mainly the radix cell the, these are on the fresh water origin cells and uh, the screenochronology can tell us about the physical and chemical condition du during the uh, during the uh, lifespan of these cells and uh, for a typical radix uh, cell the time span of their lifespan is approximately one year so they can talk about the they, they can uh, tell us about the seasonal variability uh, for the reconstruction of uh, the temperature and salinity of uh, the lake we collected the modern day uh, water sample and uh, 
what sample and carried out this table and isotope analysis and uh, um, the bi bivariant plot uh, of the salinity and delta oxygen 18 shows a very well correlation that is uh, r square value 0.99 we used to model this uh, linear equation to model the pellet salinity of the lake and uh, we used the uh, equation given by Grossman and Ku uh, to establish the temperature using the gastropod cell and uh, here we can see in uh, for an example of a cell uh, we can clearly depict the se seasons uh, in which the cell has been get uh, get uh, li lifespan during the cell we identified the fresh water loving diatom uh, from the gastropod bearing se sediment La sedimentary layers and these are so, some of the diatoms are like stephanodiscus, uh, epithem, epithemia, coconis, and these are of freshwater origin. So, uh, based on the OSL chronology of the uh, top set of uh, the deltas which have gastropod bearing layer, we are able to identify two phases of freshening in lake. Uh, one is from 2.8 to 2.2 kilo year before present and the second is from 1.7 to 1.1 kilo year present before present and uh, this shows that the lake salinity and temperature was below to the present day salinity and temperature of uh, the lake and these phase are well correlated with the uh, delta d value uh, on the leaf wax uh, provided by how at all and uh, also during these these phase uh, the concentration of saline diatom was decreased uh, provided by gas at all 1996 and uh, this can be so you should sum up now okay. uh, in the by by watching the present day landscape uh, we can see that Pangong, so uh, uh, lake level has been pulled approximately four meters during the past 20 years. Thank you. Thank you, Sumit. Uh, I fear that we do not have time for discussion, but uh, I request audience to please type your questions in the chat box and all the presenters who have presented their talk, they can attend to the questions. Thank you so much, Sumit. I request you to please unshare your screen. Espita, Roy yes. is there? Yes. OK. Now I request Ispita, Ipsita to please present to share her screen. Yes, sir. The paper is Climate Variability During Holocene at Dokriani Glacier Valley, Western Himalaya. Sita, please. Uh, hello everyone. This is a part of my PhD work where I have tried to find out the climate variability during Holocene at the Dokriani Glacier Valley, which is at the Western Himalaya. So the Himalaya plays an important role in the hydrology, biodiversity, civilization, and the economy of the Indian subcontinent. But due to the global warming, there is a recorded average temperature rise especially during the second half of the 20th century. So this warming trend has induced changes in the hydrology and the biodiversity of this Himalayan region. In the Himalayan region also, the subalpine and the alpine altitudes are more sensitive to the climate change and are important for understanding the paleoecological variations. So it becomes important to understand the long-term climate variability and what would be its impact on the vegetation and the glacier dynamics so as to predict uh, the future uh, climate for a sustainable management of the ecosystem. Even though meteorological data is available from the Himalaya, but it's for a short duration, so as to get the long-term climate variability, uh, the data at uh, temporal and spatial scale that has been studied through the proxy records such as Poland stable carbon isotope, ice cores, photons, speleotherm, tree rings, etc. 
So I have chosen this study area, that is the Dokriani Glacier Valley, which lies in the Western Himalaya, and the precipitation over here is being influenced both by the Indian summer monsoon during the summer months and the Western disturbance during the winter months. So these are a few photographs from the sampling site where A and B shows the vegetation distribution at this area. Uh, the vegetation here at uh, the sampling site is mostly of uh, Juniperus, Petula, then Rhododendron, Abies, and so on. And C and D is the subalpine meadow from where we have collected the core, the subsurface sedimentary core for studying the proxy. So this uh, subalpine altitude uh, from where we have collected, this is at around 3,500 meters uh, sea level. So for this, uh, before generating the past uh, vegetation and climate data, uh, I have uh, generated the modern pollen vegetation relationship that was being studied from the valley. The moss samples were collected at an altitudinal gradient representing the different vegetation zones. And then after inferring this present pollen vegetation relationship, then I uh, started studying the uh, past vegetation climate. For this, the 125 uh, centimeter one uh, core was collected, uh, of which was of 125 centimeter uh, uh, deep. So then the panelogy and the stable carbon isotope data sets were generated for this sedimentary profile at BSIP and the uh, radiocarbon dates, that is AMS C14 dates, were done at IOSC New Delhi, and a few uh, conventional radiocarbon dates were done from BSIP also. This is uh, the composite diagram of uh, the pollen assemblage and the delta uh, 13 carbon values from the core. So the radiocarbon dates are both from AMS and conventional radiocarbon methods, uh, where five dates are with, uh, from AMS method and two are uh, with the conventional method. So the date extrapolates to around 11.6 KABP and uh, the uh, fluctuations in the panological and the delta 13 carbon uh, values, they have been uh, zonated into these seven zones according to the whatever fluctuations is being uh, visible in uh, their assemblage. So that also denotes the ecological shifts and the ecological variations. So these uh, here in these in this diagram, I have tried to plot a few major taxa, which shows the ecological shifts and along with it, the delta 13 carbon uh, data set from this study. And uh, here I could get these uh, three climatic phases where uh, since my core extends to 11.6 KABP, so I could get an extension of the YD uh, till around 10 KABP that was being evidenced by the uh, this high steppe value that is the dry indicating taxa. Also, the delta 13 carbon value over here was around minus 26.5 per mil. So then after which it shifted towards a more moist climate as also indicated by this moist taxa and a drop in this uh, steppe taxa. Then it was around, since around 8.5 KABB, a uh, rise in the arboreal taxa was being seen that uh, shows the, uh, that the establishment of the arboreal taxa to, uh, took place towards this uh, sampling altitude. Uh, from around 8.5 KABP. Then it was again at around 6.5 KABP where an increase, uh, a gradual increase was seen in the moisture loving taxa and the percentage of this moisture loving taxa at around 6.5 KABP. Then this gray bar that shows a dry phase that is the 4.2 KABP also seen uh, with in the data set as evidenced by the delta 13 carbon data set uh, around minus 26, around minus 26 per mil, and the, the, a slight increase in the steppe taxa also at the same time. Then at around uh, 1.2 to 0.8 KABB, there was a uh, increase, slight increase in the moisture loving taxa that uh, went up to around 45 
percent and also a drop can be seen in the delta uh, this 13 carbon data set towards a uh, uh, more negative that is minus uh, 27.5 per mil so that shows a moist phase and also which brackets the uh, medieval warm period uh, the globally documented medieval warm period then uh, once then i compared my data set my uh, step it axa percentage and uh, the delta 13 carbon data set from my study along with few other studies uh, the reported studies such as the gisp2 isco data set then the mamulu cave uh, data the delta 18 o of mamulu cave uh, uh, by okay. hammer and uh, the G. buloides percentage from the Arabian Sea. And also, uh, there was a coherence was seen among these uh, published data sets and the data that uh, is being generated from this Tokriani Glacier Valley. So, uh, coming on to the conclusion, since this is a high resolution hydroclimate data set, uh, since 11.6 KABP, so more such data sets are being required at a finer resolution from the different precipitation zones so as to have a finer uh, climatic uh, the paleoclimatic data set and which can be used for a predictive modeling of the future then from my data set i could uh, record the dry climatic events such as the younger dries and the 4.2 kadp and also the moist climate as 6.5 kadp and uh, during this medieval warm period and after this medieval warm period an increase in delta 13 carbon values was being noticed since around 0.8 kabp that indicates towards a uh, gradual shift towards the dry climate and uh, when i compared the present uh, data set the present pollen vegetation relationship with this past uh, vegetation uh, data set so I could uh, conclude that this present vegetation prevailed in the study area since uh, 400 years BP. So, thank you. All right. Uh, okay. Thank you, Shrita. There are a few questions in the chat box, and I request you to please address the questions from there itself. And yes, it's the time to move on with the next presentation. Sayyid Azharuddin, are you there? Uh, yes, sir. I'm here. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, please share your presentation. Uh, okay, uh, just a second. Uh, just a second, let me share. Azar will be presenting a high resolution record of nitrous oxide variation from the South Pole during the Holocene. Great. Uh, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Sayyad Azaruddin. I, I work at Full National University. I'm a postdoc here, and uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, my co authors. Uh, uh, Please share your screen. Uh, you cannot see my screen now? Not yet. Uh, maybe there is... Uh, can you see now? Yes, yes. Coming. now it is coming. Uh, yeah, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors uh, for this work. And uh, in my talk, I'll be uh, uh, introducing my study and then I'll talk about my study area and then a little about methods and then I'll show my results. and. Uh, uh, then I'll show some conclusions about my results. Uh, so first of all, uh, uh, a little introduction about ice core studies. Uh, uh, if we see uh, in an ice core or the glacier ice, ice sample, those are quite different from the normal ice which we have in our freezers. Uh, we can see the, these small bubbles uh, which uh, in the ice, and these small bubbles are the uh, in the glacier ice are the uh, remnants of ancient air which are which got trapped uh, during the snow accumulation as you can see in the right side figure uh, that uh, so, uh, slowly uh, with the snow accumulation and fresh snowfall uh, over the surface this uh, 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 gets solidified and becomes glacier uh, after several hundred years or thousand years so basically our uh, job in this study was uh, to uh, study the nitrous oxide concentration, which is an important greenhouse gas. Uh, and it, it is actually very important because it has a larger, uh, uh, larger greenhouse gas uh, uh, potential than CO2. Uh, and uh, it has uh, another property of uh, ozone destruction. So that's why this is an important gas. Uh, so the primary sources of atmospheric N2O are nitrification and denitrification processes, which occur in terrestrial soil, as well as in ocean. Uh, and the main sink is through the photolysis in the stratosphere. Uh, 
so uh, in this study, our aim was to uh, uh, study the high resolution N2O uh, during the Holocene uh, pro by using the South Pole ice core record and other existing records. So a little introduction about my study area. Uh, the uh, South Pole ice core SC14 core was uh, drilled during 15 and 16 uh, 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 scoring sessions by American uh, spy score group. And then uh, the elevation at that site is around 2835 meters. Uh, and the snow accumulation rate is currently around 8 centimeter per year. Uh, and the annual temperature of the site is around minus 51 degrees. Uh, so, uh, coming to the methods, uh, uh, you can see in this figure that uh, uh, normally there are two parts of our methodology. First is the extraction part where we extract the air uh, which is uh, entrapped inside the glacier sample. So, we use this uh, uh, freezer room uh, which is uh, uh, around uh, maintained at around minus 22 degrees so that the ice won't melt during the sampling. So, we cut the ice here and uh, we use this special uh, 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 special setup in our lab where uh, we use these sample cups and then uh, we uh, we submerge these cups in pre-chilled uh, uh, ethanol bath and then uh, after uh, after some time we uh, put uh, it in 60 degrees hot water bath so that it could be melt and it goes to a specialized uh, uh, specialized vacuum line by which uh, it goes to the GC and then it could be measured. Uh, the N2O is basically measured using uh, micro ECD detector uh, in the uh, Agilent GC. So basically for our study, the average standard deviation of replicates from the same depth, same depth is around 1.3 parts per billion. Uh, so uh, this coming to the results, this is the uh, record we generated for uh, around uh, 10,500 years, and uh, there were some points around uh, uh, 11,000 years. Uh, so basically, the concentration of N2O varied between around 273 ppb to around uh, uh, 252 ppb, uh, and uh, we see that uh, there is a maximum around uh, uh, around 10 kilo air, and then there is an N2O decrease between 6 to 8 kilo air, and again we see an increasing trend from uh, 6 kilo air onwards. Uh, so uh, to check the, uh, to have, to gain more confidence on our measurements, uh, we compared the, uh, our uh, the record for 2,500 years with the previously measured record from other ice cores, that is NEMAN 6, which are recently published from, the, from our lab, and they were measured in the same facility. And this red line shows the spice record, and this blue and yellow line shows the record of uh, NEMAN 6 ice cores. And uh, as we can see that overall, uh, our record agrees well with the previously measured record. Uh, so we gain more confidence over our measurements. And then uh, since the, our results do not cover full Holocene, so uh, we took help of other ice core and tour records to make, uh, uh, to complete uh, our uh, full Holocene record. And then uh, we used uh, EDML, Chaldez, North Grip, uh, Neiman 6 ice cores and made a new uh, N2O, uh, uh, N2O composite for the Holocene period. And uh, the work is uh, submitted recently for publication. And in this N2O composite, uh, we basically see four major periods of N2O change during the Holocene. And first is, as you can see, there's the blue bar, uh, which is from 11.5 kilo air to around 10 kilo air. We see the very high, and, uh, like uh, around 15 ppb of a, uh, N2O increase. And then uh, after 10 kilo air onwards, till around, uh, till around 6.2 kilo air, we see an N2O decrease. Uh, uh, and then there is another increase between 6.2 to 2.2 kilo air, and then another local minimum of N2O around 1.4 kilo air uh, before present. So uh, using the N2O record, we calculated the N2O flux by using the two box model. Uh, and then the flux, uh, N2O flux in teragram nitrogen per year, uh, it varies between uh, 10 to 11 teragram nitrogen per year. And as you can see that it, it matches very well with the N2O concentration record where highest increase is seen between 11.5 to 10 kilo air. That is, around, that is the period of pre-boreal. Uh, and then there is another decrease between 10 to 6 kilo air onwards and the same trend follows. So basically, uh, we tried to study the mechanism of uh, N2O uh, variation. Uh, so uh, we did some literature survey uh, so recently published records uh, say that the uh, nitrous oxide uh, uh, production in the terrestrial soils 
basically depends on temperature and precipitation, uh, which alters the soil texture, uh, moisture content, microbial ecology, as well as the substrate uh, avail availability in the soils. And then uh, the precipitation shows a globally constant trend with increase uh, uh, and decrease in precipitation. Uh, with increased, uh, uh, increased precipitation increases the N2O uh, emission, whereas the decrease in pre precipitation uh, decreases the N2O emission from the area. So roughly, if we see uh, the regions uh, of N2O uh, emission, the highest N2O emitting uh, terrestrial regions are the uh, monsoon, major monsoonal regions of the world, uh, that is uh, American... American monsoon, uh, Asian monsoon, and African monsoon regions. So uh, uh, coming to the marine records, uh, if we see the marine records, uh, the major uh, uh, upwelling regions, uh, that is the Arabian Sea and the Eastern Tropical South Pacific are the major contributors of atmospheric N2O. So basically, we compare the paleoproxy records with our N2O record uh, uh, from the major monsoon regions. Uh, as we can see that between 11.5 to 10 kilo air, uh, there is the highest increase, which shows that increase in Asian monsoon region, whereas it doesn't match well with the other monsoon regions. Uh, and if we compare it with the marine records, uh, then marine records uh, uh, shows a much co uh, better correlation with N2O product, uh, N2O emission during the Holocene, with highest uh, with increase uh, during the pre-boreal time, and there is a big, uh, uh, a big uh, in, uh, like uh, weakening of oxygen minimum zones uh, at the Peru margin, Chile margin, and Arabian Sea. Please which finish is, your talk. As a... uh, yeah, sure. Uh, just uh, just two minutes. So, and then there is an increase in uh, ocean denitrification, which can be seen in increase in N2O. Uh, so we uh, did some correlation analysis, which also shows the uh, similar results and strengthens our uh, observation. So finally, com coming to conclusion uh, that uh, between 11.5 to 10 kilo air, uh, there is a, an inter in intensification of northern hemisphere monsoons, uh, as well as southern South American and Australian mon monsoons, which may have contributed the N2O emission. And uh, as, as coming to marine, there is an inter intensification of oxygen minimum zones around Arabian Sea and Chile margin, which may have contributed to the N2O emission during in that period. Uh, during 10 to 6.2 kilo air, uh, weakening of South America American monsoon took place, uh, as well as the oxygen minimum zones uh, around Arabian Sea and Eastern Tropical South Pacific uh, at both Peru and Chile margin uh, have, have been observed. That may have contributed to the weakening of uh, decrease in uh, atmospheric N2O during this time period. Coming to 6.2 to 2.2 kilo air, the intensification of South American monsoon and Australian and Indonesian monsoon took place, which so sir, have I, think I have to stop uh, your presentation. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, thank, uh, thank you. you very much for you. And then I and you may have some questions answer. in the chat box um, that you'll be you. you are requested to attend. Okay, sure. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much for giving I'm sorry me. for stopping you abruptly, but uh, we need to maintain the time. Okay, thank you. Now, is Dr. Ruby Ghosh is there with us? Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I am okay. here. Ruby, please share okay. your screen. Okay. And, so, is it visible? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Let's welcome Dr. DM Energy Sahab. Energy Sir, welcome, please. And Ruby will be presenting evolution of Indian summer monsoon in the Bengal region during the past around 10 a and coupled shift in lacustrine ecosystems. Uh, Ruby, please maintain the time. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, is it visible now? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, okay, sir. Uh, so, on behalf of my co-authors, I am here to present a, a work uh, on evolution of Indian summer monsoon in the Bengal region and the history covers uh, for last uh, 10,000 kilo years, uh, 10,000 years and uh, shift in a lacustrine ecosystem. So, uh, without wasting much time on how, why this uh, ISM variation is important to us because we all know that uh, ISM is integral part of Indian socio uh, agricultural based Indian socioeconomy and uh, a, um, even a minor change in ISM can um, be devastating for us. So uh, we have targeted a region where, uh, which is under sole influence of uh, Bay of Bengal branch of uh, Indian summer monsoon and uh, not much work has been done regarding this no systematic study has been done for ism variation from this area that is the bengal region or bengal basin 
we have targeted the north uh, northern part of bengal basin which is uh, you can see from this uh, map uh, rainfall map that is it is it comes under a high rainfall region uh, region and uh, uh, i can mention here that uh, uh, this region receives 30% more uh, rainfall from other parts of india so uh, understanding the uh, ism variation from a high from such a high rainfall region uh, with the help of lacustrine uh, archive is a difficult task so we applied a lot of uh, Um, uh, other proxies, a lot of proxies to understand the variability observed in the ISM in the last ten thousand years. So to do so, uh, we have collected, uh, we have uh, dug a trench in a. As you can see, this is a wetland uh, within a the. within a deep forest in uh, situated at the northern part of the bengal basin or the uh, foothill regions of the eastern himalaya which is its maximum precipitation and by this time and this is as you can see this is dried lake and uh, from where we have dug a 2 uh, meter uh, profile and collected sediment samples and uh, we have five uh, ams dates uh, to build our hdf model using bcron and uh, this is the hdf model and uh, so this uh, sedimentary archive covers uh, the preserve the history of the last 10000 uh, 10.2 kilo year span and uh, as i said earlier we have employed a number of proxies to understand the uh, changes in the lake level as well as uh, if we can also also find out the driver what is which is the most influential driver whether it is temperature or precipitation uh, so to do so we have applied non polar palinomorph phytolith stable carbon isotope uh, magnetic and environmental magnetic parameters uh, and uh, grain size parameters as well and with the basis of on the basis of this uh, proxies like this npp uh, uh, including the algal fungal and geological remains we have identified there is a well phases of changes in this 10.2 uh, uh, k span and uh, phytolith data are also showing the similar trend uh, but in, uh, not only we have used this phytolith spectra we have used some uh, phytolith indices which are uh, globally used uh, Uh, for direct climate interpretations for example the ic or ric reverse climatic index uh, these are linked to the te mean temperature change and these index are uh, this climate index uh, actually portrays the ratio of the c3 to c4 grass variation in any given time span another index in, is uh, iph uh, which uh, distinguish between the c4 dry loving or c4 wet loving grasses that means uh, it uh, shows you the balance uh, or dominance of uh, dry loving or wet loving grasses in an ecosystem that means the wet or dry condition and f is the water stress index we also have used the stable isotopic variability here so uh, and these are the uh, magnet variation of the um, environmental magnetic parameters and uh, grain size parameters along the uh, co uh, sediment uh, profile and uh, just i want to mention here that uh, this uh, profile is a silt dominated one and here uh, the silt uh, percentages are showing high correlations uh, high positive strong positive correlation uh, with the uh, susceptibility uh, magnetic susceptibility uh, whereas clay percentage are showing negative uh, strong negative correlation with the magnetic susceptibility that means with the high energy condition or intense rainfall condition more silt will be deposited uh, had deposited in the profile and uh, but uh, surprisingly sand percentage do, uh, do not have any correlation with the, any of the magnetic parameters so these are the variability absorbed so on the basis of this variability uh, uh, we can uh, see that there are successive changes in the uh, this lacustrine profile and uh, from a deep lake condition to a, a marshy land uh, their lake has gone under several uh, phases of changes and uh, to see whether our uh, how far our um, observations are reliable we have done also the uh, 
principal component analysis on the uh, biotic data like uh, NPP and phytoliths. And uh, you can see that uh, this NPP data uh, here, um, in both the cases, PC axis 1 are the most influential axis. Uh, for NPP data, and the PC axis 1 shows uh, the, uh, captures the signature of the lake evolution, where the, uh, you can see this samples, uh, the sediment samples from the left side of the axis 1 are uh, showing the signatures of high lake stand, whereas uh, uh, gradual, uh, gradual decline um, is shown in the right, uh, right side, which is uh, these sediments are uh, showing the low lake stand or gradual decline in the lake level. Uh, but uh, phytolite data uh, preserve the climatic signal. Uh, as I said, uh, as I said earlier, phytolite data is the uh, climatic signal. And from uh, left to right side, uh, uh, high way high monsoon or high, uh, wet, wet condition to compare to dry condition is seen. So uh, com uh, combining all these data, uh, we can say that uh, there are several phases of changes in the last 10 kilo year span in the uh, Bengal Basin region. And uh, to see uh, whether these uh, changes are coherent in the uh, BOB ISM realm in the, so we have uh, compared our proxy records like Mm, uh, RIC, IPH, and silt percentages with uh, uh, not Bengal, uh, not B, uh, BOB, sea surface salinity record, and uh, Del D and Elkin record from the not BOB, which are monsoon proxy record and salinity records, and also for the terrestrial uh, uh, oxygen isotope records from uh, Dongi Cave and Mamlu Cave, uh, Northeast India and China. So, uh, it, uh, although it, I admit that. Uh, this uh, our data is uh, comparatively uh, of course a resolution uh, uh, if we consider the, the other data but uh, overall a tra similar trend is observed uh, uh, in the uh, ism variation across the uh, ism bob region prelim and uh, when we consider the uh, um, uh, to understand the for major forcing for ism change uh, we consider the uh, other proxy records from uh, uh, known forcing of the ism like the solar insulation uh, titanium record of the uh, titanium record for the itcj dynamics and the northern uh, uh, to summarize okay, sir. Uh, yes yes I, I am summarizing sir northern hemisphere temperature anomaly record and we find that in uh, for the millennium scale ism changes uh, itcj and uh, solar insulation are the two major forces and uh, but centennial scale changes are uh, driven by several forcing uh, working collectively for example i can just uh, uh, tell that if, uh, that 4.2 kilo year event when uh, not only there was a decline in solar insulation, ITCJ was uh, uh, moved to uh, southward, and at that time, the ENSO was also, the ENSO variability was also more than the early Holocene. And the Northern Atlantic was also showed the uh, AMOC was also weakened. So uh, we can say that more high resolution studies are required. Uh, to comment on the or point in point the uh, exact forcing so this is all for now and uh, i acknowledge thank our director and funding thank you dr ghosh and thank uh, you, sir. work and i'm sure i mean there are a few questions for you in the chat box i request you to please attend those questions okay sir sir now there's next speaker i'm seeing atrai bhattacharya is there and i request atrai to please share her screen Atrey will be presenting sediments in man-made lakes in semi-arid climate hotspots of Western India, preserved high-resolution records of regional rainfall variability. Atrey, please. You have to unmute yourself. All right. So thank you, Pradeep, and everyone else for having me. So. Um, I am going to take off from where our keynote speaker left off, that uh, this is an exercise in paleoclimate, but it is, it is, it is, it, it started off what we thought would be a paleoclimate exercise, but it was motivated by understanding human environment systems. And, uh, and as uh, Robert said, that this requires a team of 
people with different skill sets. So you can see a host of people that specifically like to mention Sudeep Sarkar at ICER Pune, uh, Jill Leonard Pingo and Andy Michelson, who are paleontologists. Sudeep is a geophysicist. And then Anu Praveen Supriyo and the rest of us, uh, quite, quite a few of us are geochemists. And then we have A. Patacharya from IIT Kharagpur, who is a petrologist, uh, and M. Kirby, who is an arid environment specialist. We also, so this is a work that's currently under revision. And I'd also like to specifically mention Raja Gopal and Balaji at the University of Colorado Boulder, where I'm from, and Gaurav Arora at IIIT Delhi, where I hold an adjunct position. The, the first one is an engineer, and the second one is an economist. And, and in a minute, I hope to convince you that the motivation requires participation of not just earth scientists, but people outside those domains. So yes, uh, these are man-made lakes or reservoirs or, or talabs, differently called in different parts of our country and also uh, in, in, known by several names across South Asia, especially arid regions of South Asia. Uh, so one of the motivations for this study came from the fact that uh, studies, statistical studies, are, are, are telling us that there's going to be wide-scale social disruption, particularly human migration, in response to even a two degrees Celsius warming in temperature. Now, the top panel is uh, the current population density. India and China and Western Europe sort of stands out. And, and, to, uh, and the second panel is a, a response to two degrees Celsius changes. You see, you know, more than 500 kilometers of vast human displacement and migration. And one of the questions we wanted to know is that we don't pack our bags and go because the temperature was high. Uh, what causes people to move? Uh, and we knew that we couldn't just answer the question with 10 years of data. We needed to take a long term or a long jury approach. So uh, just to understand sort of these climate society interactions, the way society reacts is sort of simplified, but not terribly unclear, I hope. There are climate extremes and hazards, floods. Uh, we, we learned about floods. Long-term changes, a lot of you have been talking about long-term changes. And together, these impact biophysical environment, plant growth, human and animal. And once that starts getting impacted, we see economic feedbacks, demographic feedbacks, and at some point it, it sort of goes into political feedbacks, which is a far more complex process. And because we wanted to understand demographic and economic feedback, I hope that explains why we partner with engineers and also economists, uh, we wanted to look at sort of what are the biophysical effects of uh, climate extremes and, and are the human environment systems that have come to characterize our living environment over the last millennium consistent with those kinds of risks and changes. So uh, the motivation was really to understand the economic impacts associated with uh, climate variability in semi-arid agroeconomies of the Indian subcontinent. Climate models project that semi-arid regions of peninsular India is going to become more dry. Uh, and that at more than two and a half degrees Celsius, the economic impacts would be more, far more severe than we can handle with our current socioeconomic structures. Uh, particularly important would be drought, uh, and, and Asia stands to lose the most. So uh, especially smallholder farmers. So this entire thing was not motivated to understand climate, but to really see whether we can apply our understanding of recent history uh, in order to make some recommendations about sustainability and policies that can keep these regions sustainable over the next century and beyond. So just to give you a sense of what we are expecting, this is the IATM MOES model. Uh, Maharashtra, as you can see, is green and also southern parts of Gujarat. And overall, these re the, while red indicates decreasing rainfall trends during the monsoon and blue indicates increasing monsoonal strengths, there are regions that are green indicating that we don't quite understand or maybe the trends are not statistically significant. And yet, on ground, we know that there are issues with hydroclimate and water security, particularly the state of Maharashtra from where I am zooming in. We see that most of Maharashtra is a semi-arid region, meaning that water balances, evaporation loses water, what we came from uh, preset, except the coastal regions. Uh, 
And most of these region is now being converted into sugarcane country, which requires about 12, 1800 millimeters of rainfall. When several of these internal, sorry, interior regions uh, basically get no more than 200 to 300 millimeters of rainfall. So there is a, a potential problem brewing. Uh, we do know that riverbeds tend to run dry during the summer as well as rest of the year. And the puddles of water that collect in these regions are used not just for drinking and washing uh, and hydropower generation and agriculture, but also by subsistence farmers like fish, fishing people that we see here. Um, so uh, as I said, the motivation was to understand sort of what could be an economic policy that could incentivize preservation of landscape and natural resources as we are starting to see major conflicts coming into the region, uh, particularly in this case, we're going to talk about Maharashtra. So uh, the area of study is Maharashtra. And the, what you see here is sort of the, you know, a, a zoomed out view of the climate landscape today. And as I mentioned, Maharashtra, most of it is semi-arid and interior. And the blue color indicates uh, better, more uh, you know, available moisture, warmer colors indicate less so. And what we wanted to do was to really create a century scale record of climate, but also environmental and vegetation changes. And we, and we surveyed the region and something that we found very commonly were reservoirs, where uh, the rivers come from pretty much here, these basins, northeast to southwest south. And they are dammed, they have been dammed. You can see these dam structures. Uh, to use the water for hydroelectricity, agriculture, domestic water, uh, all of that. Primarily hydroelectricity and agriculture, but it's also used for water supply and other kinds of activities, as I showed. So our area would be the current focus. So we uh, zoomed into two reservoirs, which we, which we thought uh, you know, would allow us to test this hypothesis proof of concept. One is the Indira Bazaar, which is sort of close to Bombay near Pune, and therefore more wetter. And the other one was Lake Matwali, which is more arid uh, towards the eastern part. So here is the drainage basin for Matwali, and here is what the remote sensing images of the drainage basin of Lake Indira Bazaar. Um, and, 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 a, and a Google Earth image kind of shows, so this is how the rivers, the feeder streams come and are dammed to the south and the water sort of builds up over here and are used for varied purposes. Agriculture is quite big. Uh, and here is what it looks like on ground. So a lot of these waters are stored in wells, dug wells we call them, and used for agriculture. And this is how the water, so this is the lake and those are the dug wells near the lake. So this is how it looks like. And I just showed you, um, uh, you know, the, the sort of the environment. And you can see sort of these stratifications, uh, lake stands. Uh, we went in the summer, quite a few summers. So those are high lake, uh, high lake stands and low lake stands. And you can see that there was forceful water because you see all these cobblestones near these um, uh, lake layers. So once again, remember uh, Indira Bazaar is sort of near Pune and Vedar and uh, Matwali is to the east southeast and in a more drier regime. So this is Matwali, this is Indira Bazaar. So very similar latitude and longitude in that way. Only difference is climatological. Um, so one of the first things we did was we wanted to understand the sub bottom. So the first thing we wanted to do was sort of understand the history of the modern dam structure. And we looked at the satellite images that goes all the way till 1973. And we found that the Matwali, the, the water kind of structure, was there from sort of 1988-89. Before that, there were no sort of structures, no water. So we knew these were more modern. The Indira Bazaar went back all the way till 1973. And there, were, there, there appears to be a drainage pattern that indicates a pre-existing lake, but there were no satellite images prior to that. So the Indira Bazaar seems to be a more older system, just from assessment of- Please summarize your talk. So the one thing we did was we first applied geophysics in order to profile the sub bottom. So the Matwali and the Indira Bazaar. So these parallel line seismic reflections indicate that these are more reservoir like deposition. And below that we have more torrential river like deposition. And we use both gravity coring and vibra coring in order to look at these two regions. 
And we got about a meter of pore using these techniques. Uh, some of these lakes, uh, the Indira Bazaar was drained out of water the day we cored, so we had to do push coring, like walk into the clay pond and, and get our cores, but we still managed to get them. And what we did was we characterized the core using traditional methods of magnetic susceptibility, core imaging, XRF, and radiometric dating. And what we found was, um, I don't know what's going on. Um, so, uh, sorry, I think, um, so what we found was that, that there were two sorts of depositional regimes. I don't know what's going on here. So please summarize your talk. Yes, hold on, I am. So what we found here was that the Matwali was more modern. So there is this high rainfall flood-like event of 1988, after which the dam structure was built. So there are three sorts of depositional regime. And then the Indira Bazaar, it was a more continuous deposition, which seemed to be controlled by regional rainfall. And we also basically uh, looked at titanium aluminum ratios to identify peaks associated with rainfall. And we found that there were all these flood events associated with extreme rainfall in the arid region. And there were all these peaks associated with uh, uh, sort of the IDBZ, which is more continuous and reflective of uh, less flooding in the region. In fact, in these areas, the, the, during the floods, the amount of sediments deposited were 20 times larger than what we see in the background. So very quickly, a reservoir preserved major hydroclimatic events requires a multi-pronged approach to characterize and reconcile. Bridges critical gap in the domain of climate timescales of human interest and provides critical management information at local level. And these are ongoing works. I'm going to leave you with that because I've been prodded by Pradeep to quickly uh, complete my talk. So thank you all for your attention. Thank you, and I'm sorry for stopping you in between. And uh, there are a few appreciations and a few questions for you in the chat box that Thank I request you. you to please address. And uh, yeah, we'll have to move on to the next talk. Is Feroz Khan there? Yes, sir. Feroz, please share your presentation. OK, sir. Feroz will be presenting last 20K Indian summer monsoon record from Baspa Valley, Northwest Himalaya, India. Sir, I'm visible. Feroz, please stick to the time. Uh, is that visible, sir? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, uh, I will talk about the last 20K Indian summer monsoon record from Baspa Valley, Northwest Himalaya. Uh, uh, Indian summer monsoon, uh, firstly, uh, term developed by the uh, Halle 1686, uh, which uh, gave the conventional uh, conventional uh, idea about the monsoon and the wind reversal theory. The ISM is an important component of tropical climate system, coupled with the global atmospheric circulation, driven mainly by the land-sea thermal contrast and the annual migration of the intertropical convergence zone. The Indian subcontinent possesses two major climatic systems, the monsoon and the western disturbances or the western age. Uh, in India, uh, in summers from June to September, the India get uh, precipitated uh, approximate 70% due to the southwest monsoon, uh, or uh, it is called the southwest monsoon or Indian summer monsoon, mainly by the, uh, the phenomena is reversed in the northeast monsoon or the uh, retreat monsoon. Uh, Western is uh, developed from the Mediterranean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. It has two branches, North Summer Westerly or Southern Winter Westerly. In summer, uh, the North Summer Westerly uh, blow over the India, but in winters, the uh, Southern Winter Westerly enter in the uh, India and mainly in the northwestern part of the Himalayan region in and uh, get one third of precipitation in Himalayan region in high elevated area in form of snow. Uh, the study area is located in the Bhaspa Valley, uh, in North Himachal Pradesh. Uh, approximate one meter of uh, peat deposit excavated uh, at a high elevation from 3450 meter above mean sea level. Uh, geologically, the area is uh, located uh, at the transition zone of the higher central Himalaya and the uh, Tethys Himalaya. 
mainly the baspa peat deposit uh, located in the southern fringe of the tibetan plateau the main objective of the study area is the to reconstruct the paleoclimate uh, from the area and to understand the mechanism and their temporal changes due to, due to the interplay of the two primary uh, weather systems of the indian subcontinent the uh, graph shows the uh, rainfall variability uh, from 1981 to 2017 in the baspa valley uh, this shows the age depth model of the peat profile uh, from the uh, area the black color uh, number shows the radiocarbon edges uh, get from the uh, uac uh, delhi and the red color number shows the calibrated edges uh, from the uh, study area uh, this shows the uh, sedimentation rate vary uh, between the point 3 mm per year to the point 0 7 mm per year uh, to reconstruct the paleoclimate from the study area, we use multi-proxy analysis. Uh, for the for this, we have a carbon isotope, environmental magnetism, total organic carbon, uh, AMS spotman dating, and uh, one of biological proxy that is uh, diatoms. The delta 13 records are helpful to study the paleo vegetational history, climatic uh, variability, the regional precipitation of the area. Delta 13 value vary between minus 27.3 to minus 25.3 parts per meal, which indicate the same three types of plant, which shows the moderate temperature and wet uh, environment. Enhancement in the low magnetic susceptibility shows the cold and dry climate, whereas the decline in the magnetic susceptibility shows the warm and wet climate. The uh, total organic carbon value sediments vary due to the humidity, precipitation, runoff, and salinity, which indicate the productivity of the area. The diatoms are the very sensitive to the climate change. Uh, for this, we identify some diatom genus in this study area, uh, which is Pinularia. Uh, Diplonis, Rofaldia, Sturocerella, and Epithemia, which is uh, living in fresh water conditions. Uh, so, uh, over data uh, from the uh, Delta 13, so we correlate this data from the uh, Indian region, uh, mainly from the Himalayan region and the uh, four monsoon zone lake, which is Lonar Lake. Also, Delta 13 uh, value of over study area, which uh, make the bivariant. Uh, diagram with the uh, correlation with the latitude and altitude which uh, indicate the uh, baspa valley region is mainly located in the uh, ablation zone of the uh, glacier zone which have uh, low uh, low variability in the carbon isotopes so uh, this interpretation is well supported by the altitude based observation uh, as low altitude uh, peninsular lunar lake shows a broad range of uh, delta 13 value because it's located in the four monsoon zone and experience extremely wet and dry phase of climate other than uh, high well, high elevated area from the Himalayan region. Uh, uh, over uh, data uh, indicate the mainly five phases of uh, ISM changes uh, from uh, 14.9 thousand to 13.9 thousand uh, year before present, the carbon uh, isotope values depleted, uh, which indicate the uh, uh, boiling L road uh, interglacial period. Uh, and after that, the uh, one more uh, ISM uh, phase is uh, obtained, which is stronger, that is common warm yes, period. Yes. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, so, uh, these are the five uh, climatic uh, uh, ISM variability changes obtained. Uh, conclusion of this study area, the record from Baspa Valley indicate that the solar radiation variability in the northern hemisphere is leading to, for the climate change of ISM variability during the middle age Holocene. From 14.9 uh, to 13.9 Ka, the carbon isotope uh, uh, indicate wet and warm climate which uh, correlated with the boiling and road interglacial period. From 13.9 to 9.8 uh, thousand before present indicate weakening in the ISM uh, intensity, which correlate with the younger dry cooling phase. Uh, the uh, intensity to intensity of ISM uh, from 6.8 to 2.4, which correlate uh, from the 4.2 okay, global cooling event, and from ISM was intensified during the 2.4 to 1.3. 
a which associated with the ongoing period and uh, uh, that certain value of that 2 or 3 years before present so current burn period thank you all right perush thank you okay sir for your presentation and we do not have time okay. for the discussions and uh, there may be few questions in the chat box that you may okay, sir, will to address let us move to the next talk is uh, pooja nitin saraf is there yes sir okay pooja please share your screen pooja yes, will be sir. presenting using proxy data and vegetation modeling to predict past current and future distributional shifts of bituia monosperma a therapist for land degradation in india interesting please move over yes sir good afternoon everyone i am pooja nitin saraf inspire jrf working under the supervision of dr jyoti shrivastava today i would like to present our work with you all that is using proxy data and vegetation modeling to predict the past current and future distribution shift of butia monosperma a therapist for land degradation in india as we know the tropical biome is a one which has undergone now uh, which is a world climate domain which has undergone maximum forest deterioration and over exploitation climate is the main driving features in the region for rising temperature and changing precipitation pattern the butia monosperma is a important tree species of dry deciduous forest it belongs to family fabaceae and it is a native to tropical and subtropical environment it has a very great potential to restore and enhance the biological activities in degraded land through nitrogen fixation and it promotes vegetation establishment the main objective of our study are to map the most suitable distribution of butia monosperma under the past that is from last glacial maximum and middle holocene current and future as well as to cross validate the middle holocene model projection by fossil pollen evidences of the species from various paleo vegetational reconstruction study most importantly to bridge the gap between paleoecology and species distribution modeling by integrating paleontological analysis since last glacial maximum and middle holocene coming to material method we have selected butia monosperma as a targeted species it is one of the most economically and ecological important species and it can regenerate naturally in the mixed deciduous forest as this species is mainly exploited for various domestic and fieldwood purposes for the modeling of the species we have collected the species occurrence data from field survey and the secondary occurrence data have been collected from gbif that is global biodiversity information facility uh, we have collected the, we have retrieved the environmental variables from world climate database version 1.4 all the bioclimatic variables had a special resolution of 30 arc second as this bioclimatic variable are highly correlated hence we perform multi collinearity test using pearson correlation analysis for modeling the distribution of butia we used maxent software a version 3.4.4 the seven fossil pollen records for middle holocene were compiled from various published literature coming to results and discussion these are the important bioclimatic variables which we have used to model the species response toward climate variations coming to analysis of environmental variable affecting the distribution of butia monosperma the maxent result revealed that the bio4 that is temperature seasonality and bio12 that is annual mean annual mean precipitation and along with bio1 and bio15 are the main bioclimatic variables which are driving the distribution of the species Additionally, the max maxent result also revealed that the bio four uh, with thirty nine point two percent and bio twelve with fifteen point nine percent contribute maximum to the distribution of the species. According to the criteria of Swetz, the AUC value, that is area under the curve, is very much useful to uh, to me uh, to me measure the performance of the model. Here we have got the AUC value of zero point seven five two, which indicates the moderate performance of our model. the jackknife test the jackknife test is very much helpful to uh, to study the impact of each bioclimatic variable on the distribution of the species the jackknife result shows that the bio4 along with bio3 and bio8 makes a maximum contribution current distribution of butia monosperma in the india based on the current climatic condition and bioclimatic variable the result showed that the gir region in the western parts and southern western ghats including nilgiri regions and satmala range in maharashtra possesses highly and moderately suitable habitat while in the northeastern region it the low suitable habitat are mainly present in assam valley foothills of tripura and mizo hill heading to 
distribution of butyl monos bromine future under the rcp 2.6 and rcp 4.5 the moderately suitable habitat and highly suitable habitat will be going to reduce in the gear region in the western part and south western ghats however we can see the low suitable habitat will going to be entirely diminish in the center, uh, central india covering satpura and vindhya range for rcp 6 there is significant decline in highly and moderately suitable habitat in the western and southwestern region however in the northeastern region it will only present in mizo and naga hills in rcp 8.5 we can clearly seen there is a sharp decline and very shows a very small patchy distribution in the western region and southwestern ghats our analysis of percentage change analysis in suitable habitat has shown there is a decrease in highly suitable habitat from the current range and there is increase in unsuitable habitat for rcp 2.6 4.5 6 and 8.5 respectively for lgm and mid holocene there is significant increase in highly suitable habitat while there is decrease in not suitable habitat uh, the lgm distribution of butyl monos perma in india shows that the it covers more suitable area as compared to current climatic scenario there is a highest probability of butyl monos perma in the gir region in the western parts and southwestern ghats covering satmala range and nilgiri hills and complete area of kerala it also cover the indo gangetic plain and central india region covering satpura and vindhya range model based model versus fossil based distribution of butyl monosperma in order to assess the performance of species distribution model we have compared the species distribution projection with fossil pollen data here we can see the five fossil pollen points of butyl monosperma were located in the within the so, low suitable habitat and one record was centered in extremely low suitable habitat the fossil pollen data supports the distribution of butyl monosperma in the central india region covering madhya pradesh uttar pradesh and chatisgarh state which are estimated as low suitable habitat in the species distribution map coming to conclusion the our study which be provide very much helpful information about the probable changes in the butyl monosperma distribution in the past present and future climatic scenario the habitat suitability of the butyl monosperma tend to decrease from rcp 2.6 to rcp 4.5 with a sharp decline from rcp 6 to 8.5 the broader picture of the 2070 and the different rcp suggested that the potential suitable habitat will decrease in southern and western region and the low suitable habitat will sustain in north eastern region our study will provide a scientific basis to provide the conservation of butyl monosperma and establish reasonable management practices in the projected suitable area for achieving the optimum production and quality of its resources thank you thank you puja for your time and uh, we have 1 uh, minute for quick question questions do we have okay if not then okay uh, anupma madam has a question anupma ma'am please yeah i just want to know uh, can you identify butyl monosperma to um, species level yes ma'am you can yes ma'am okay and the other thing is see butyl monosperma is one of the avenue trees which is commonly planted all over So I'm a bit curious to know why you chose this particular uh, species for this work. Actually, I, first of yes. all, let me commend the work. It's really nice to see this kind of a new approach and modeling approach, and also the application of fossil data. I'm just curious to know why, what made you choose Butyl monosperma because it is kind of a ubiquitous species. So yes, ma'am. In the no, sense that because... it can grow all over, and it's also planted everywhere. Uh, it's yes. a major avenue tree. in most yes. parts of india in fact yes ma'am it is uh, one of the important ecological and important species and uh, as we can see it is one of the climate refugia means in the extreme condition it can survive so yes. if we if currently we can uh, save this species for future then that which very much helpful means by our prediction we can see that there is a reduction in highly suitable habitat so uh, if we started to conserve this species now then it will going to preserve for future okay 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 thank you thank you ma'am thank, thank you puja now i request you, the next presenter dr somnath kundal
Yes, sir. Sir, sir uh, please share your presentation. Okay. Dr. Kundal will be presenting change of biota and fixation of neogene quaternary boundary in Shivalik of Jammu. Okay. Please share your screen, sir. Okay, sir. Sir, screen is uh, seen, you. Hello. Yes, please make it full screen. Okay, sir. So uh, today my topic is the change of biota and fixation of new gen quaternary boundary in the Sivalika of Jammu. An overview. So uh, A is the uh, range of Sivalika hills. Can you make it full screen, sir? Is it possible? Oh, okay, sir. Yes, this is the one. Uh, so, uh, Shivalik is the southern most, uh, most uh, part of the Himalayan uh, Himalaya, and it ranges uh, from uh, Bhutan to this one in Pakistan. And uh, here is the uh, this the my study area uh, in the Jammu region. So, uh, this is the. Uh, locality and uh, geological map of the uh, Shivalik of Jammu. So uh, there is uh, lower Shivaliks, then middle Shivalik, then permandal uh, sandstone, uh, then Nagrota formation and boulder conglomerate. So permandal sandstone, Nagrota formation and boulder conglomerates is come under the upper Shivalik subgroup of Jammu. So uh, my work focuses on this Pinjor formation. That is the Nagrota formation uh, of this Jammu. Uh, area. Then next, this is, uh, this is the comparative lithostratigraphic classification of Sibalika of Jammu. So, uh, no, your screen is not moving. Your slides are not moving. We are still on the second slide. Where is it? We are still on the second slide. Sir, it is heard now. Now it is, but it's not full screen, sir. Sir, here is a full screen. Anyways, please go ahead. So, uh, the local classification of uh, Jammu given by Gupta and Burma in 1988, that is the Mansur Formation, Deval Formation, uh, uh, and then Mohargad Formation. And in the upper Shivalik subgroup, there is a Uttarvani Formation, uh, which includes the lovely member and Marikui member, and the, then uh, the uh, Dugor Formation. And uh, Rangaro uh, classified this uh, upper Shivalik subgroup of Jammu into permandal sandstone, Nagrota formation, and Tabi conglomerate. Then uh, Agarwal 1993 gave the classification, adopted the classification of uh, Rangarao and uh, classified the Nagrota form uh, formation into Nagrota member A, Nagrota member B, Nagrota member C, and then uh, Elias et al. Uh, the 2017 classified the upper Sivalik of uh, Jammu into Mansur, Deval, Mohorgar formation, then Lovely formation, then Marikui uh, uh, formation, and Dugor formation. So uh, my uh, work is focused on the Nagrota formation. Then uh, this is the profile of the upper Sivalik subgroup of uh, Jammu region. So here is a Pinjor, Boulder conglomerate. Then there is a Tetrode and Dogtan. So uh, this is the uh, magnetic polarity stratigraphy and final succession of the permandal Uttarvani uh, uh, sections given by Rangarao 1988. And here is the vertebrate uh, fauna existing in the uh, uh, different uh, locations in uh, the litho column uh, here is a uh, two bands of the uh, volcanic ash beds one is lower one and uh, other one is over one and this is the magnetostratigraphy and the volcanic ash bed is uh, coincide with the gauss matajama boundary that is 2.48 million year so uh, 
bentonite band acts as a reliable time marker horizon in the upper Sawali uh, subgroup of Jammu. Exposed at 22 localities have been since tried. So maximum thickness of the uh, bentonite tooth band is 3.6 meter at Vadakhetar and minimum thickness is 2 centimeter at Khiridi section. So uh, radiometric dates of the Bada, uh, bentonite tooth band uh, from time to time by 1940-1996 gave the age of 1.6 plus minus uh, 0.2 million years for uh, Jirkan fission track dates of Uttarvani sections. Then Jokojama uh, gave uh, 1987 gave age an age of 1.6 uh, plus minus 0 0.56 million year uh, uh, of for Jirkan affidates for Badakhetar section. Then Rangar Rao et al. 98 gave 2.8 plus minus 0.56 million year and 2.31 plus minus 0.5 uh, million uh, 4 million year FT dates of bentonite tooth band Badakhetar and Nagrota formations. So in conjunction with magnetostatigraphy, Ranga Rao et al. 1998 arrived at the conclusion that these bentonite tooth bands straddle across the gauss metajama boundary that is 2.48 million years. Then after this, Mehta et al. 1993 gave age 1.59 plus minus 0.32 million year uh, of this Badakethar section. So uh, this is the uh, Badakhetar section. Uh, so uh, below this one bentonite to van is the mudstone, uh, mudstone horizon, and uh, above the bentonite to van is the silt stone. And so you have two minutes to summarize. So uh, I, I so would suggest this, please come down to the conclusion. Okay, sir. That will be better. Yeah. So, uh, according to the Agarwal 1993, the final change is about 60 meters below the gas metam of the boundary. There are different uh, few uh, views regarding the changes of final and flora interval zones. No other uh, till date identified the particular section of the Palatian Palatian boundary and the final flora interval zones in this valley of Jammu. So, uh, during the last 10 years, I have recovered a lot of fossil specimens from uh, the uh, uh, mudstone horizon underlying the volcanic ash beds. The fossil includes uh, 22 uh, species, uh, uh, species of these uh, trace fossils within the ash beds, and uh, uh, 18 species of the astrocodes, then gastropod five species, bivalves two, terrified seven, then one is the angiosperm seeds, Boragino lachanpalis, and including uh, this one, the uh, lizards and rodents and elephants, such as uh, leaves planiforms, stegodon, and leaves planiform recovered from within the ash bed are uh, uh, underlying the ash uh, uh, beds. So these are the uh, various mm -hmm. biointerval zones of uh, other various authors given uh, proposed by the interval leaves planiform zones. So conclusion, no exact dates of the ash beds, but Rangarao et al. 1998 dates are reliable a few extent as it is based on the vertebrate paleontology, magnetostatigraphy, and fission track dating. No particular Pliocene Pliocene boundary section identified till uh, uh, till date, which we say that the, this particular section is the Pliocene Pliocene boundary section. For this, I was uh, I would like to propose Bada Khetar section as a reference section for Palaiocene plus in boundary, the region for that as bed or bentonite tooth band is acuted coincide with the gauss metajama uh, magnetic polarity scale. As bed is the marker horizon in this valley. Fauna and flora recovered from within the as bed and associated fossiliferous mudstone indicates a late Palaiocene, uh, early Pleistocene age. There is a change in taxa underlying and overlaying the as beds. Uh, the this faunal and flora changes also observed in the microvertebrates, micro and macro uh, fossils, and megavertebrates taxa. The mudstone horizon underlying. I have to stop your presentation, sir, uh, because I mean it's time to summarize. I guess finish your talk. Yeah, so, thank no you. Party. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Okay, sir. If anyone of the audience have a special a specific questions, please chat. Please put your questions in the chat box, and we'll have the answers from Dr. Kundal. Thank you, Dr. Kundal. I'm sorry for stopping you.
Okay. Uh, the next presenter of the morning is Dr. Jyoti. <laughs> Jyoti, uh, yeah, you are here. Yes, sir. I'm here. Jyoti, please share your presentation. Sure, sir. And uh, Jyoti will be presenting ensemble modeling approach to predict past and future climate suitability for two mangrove species along the coastal wetlands of India. Great. Please go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, very good afternoon to everyone here. Well, I would be presenting an ensemble modeling approach to predict the past, future and future climate suitabilities of the two important mangrove species along the coastal wetlands of India. And as we know, the tropical and the subtropical intertidal plant communities are dominated by mangroves. And these mangroves are essential ecosystem providers and are, have a direct impact on the coastal human livelihood. And these mangrove species are facing drastic deterioration due to climate change as well as human activities. Uh, uh, recent studies have shown that there has been a, a decline in the rate of loss of these mangrove species. And, but this uh, study is mainly regional and this uh, decline in the loss is regional and especially in the developing countries, still these mangrove ecosystems are facing a drastic loss, which is harmful for our livelihood, our coastal livelihood. And here we are presenting this ensemble modeling technique based on the mangrove zonation along the eastern coastline, along the Indian coastline. And here we have targeted two mangrove species, first being Rhizophora mucronata, that is on the intertidal coasts, and they are mainly fringing along the channel margin along the coastline. And these mangroves require tidal inundation throughout the year. And, and the second species which we have targeted is Abyssinia officinalis, which is towards the landward zone of the Indian coastline. Uh, they are zoned on the basis of salinity, inundation, and sedimentation rate. This Abyssinia officinalis is uh, uh, generally present along the landward side towards the inland region. They are generally not found along the channel margin, and they require tidal inundation only during high tides, only in the supratidal condition. So we have selected these two targeted species based on their widest distribution in the region and this, their varied preferences in, in estuary locations. Now coming to the methodology of this modeling approach, first stage is the data set processing and preparation, which requires a data set accumulation from species occurrence data from the present time, bioclimatic data from various databases, elevation data and fossil pollen data. Uh, we compiled all these data sets and we auto uh, the autocorrelated variables were removed and the selected bioclimatic variables were modeled along with the species occurrence data using ensemble modeling approach. Here I would like to emphasize like this is based on species distribution uh, modeling. Yes, your slides are not moving. Your slides are not moving. Sorry to interrupt, your slides are not moving and we are not seeing a full uh, slide mode. Okay, actually is it a full slide mode? I'll go back again. They're not moving. I'll share it again then. Yes. Is the screen up now? Is the screen up now? Yes, make it full screen. I've made it full screen. Then I Is guess you have to switch over, switch your slides from the left panel because it's not still we are not able to okay. see. This. Then I have changed it to a normal screen. Is it fine? Now yeah, is it changing? Is yes, please. Yes, yes. Is it changing? Okay, I'll go this yes. way only. So next, uh, I was in the methodology part. Is it moving now? Yes, please go ahead. Yes, yes. So in the third stage, we do the model evaluation in which we, pre uh, we evaluate the predictive model of the current environment, uh, current climatic scenarios through kappa and receiver operating characteristic and true still statistics. Whereas the past distribution model was validated on the basis of fossil pollen data, that is the middle Holocene species occurrence data points to improve the predictive ability, robustness, reliability, and significance of the paleo SDM analysis. Coming to the data set resources and model description, 
we generated this primary occurrence data points by field surveys in the mangrove wetlands along the southeast coast of India and the secondary data sets from published literature, global biodiversity information facility and in a Indian biodiversity portal, whereas the environmental variables, including 19 bioclimatic variables and the altitude makes it 20 environmental variables were extracted from the world climate database for the current future that is for 2050 and 2070 time scenarios and also for the past that is the middle holocene around 6000 years ago time span uh, using the adopted model of the ipcc in the fifth assessment and uh, the, thirdly the ensemble model design was made by on the basis of biomod 2 package in our software and this is an is a combination of five algorithms including the maximum entropy that is maxi nt mars generalized uh, linear model fda and random forest model that is a modern machine learning approach so we did not take single algorithm model as generally the single algorithm models they give a similar performance but the habitat suitable the estimates is different so in order to uh, cross that bias we uh, integrated all the model all the algorithms to make it more robust and made it an ensemble model design for it so the results show that the model performance was uh, preferably excellent uh, on the basis of AUC values and the TSS values and even the sensitivity of the model was high which is showing that the model was showing the correct distribution of the species present whereas the specificity of was also high showing the current distribution of the absence of these species um, okay coming to the predictor values the predictor variable importance, uh, how the variables were selected, they were on the basis of the correlation and uh, highly correlated values were extracted. And uh, on the basis of that, uh, it was seen that rhizophora mucronata was, uh, uh, distribution was changing highly significantly on the basis of precipitation of the warmest quarter and uh, the uh, that is the precipitation seasonality whereas for Abyssinia officinalis the precipitation seasonality was the most uh, uh, significant factor which was affecting its distribution okay coming to the current projection of the mangrove species along the Indian coastline uh, are you able to see the full screen now is the slide moving slide is moving but it's not the full screen okay so this is the current projection of the mangrove species along the indian coastline and this blue dots show the abyssinia officinalis uh, current distribution and with this is the occurrence data points here we see the extremely suitable habitats are mainly found in the pichavram area the vembanad area and also in the Koringa mangrove area in the mahanadi delta we see moderately suitable habitats uh, now coming to the past projection of the mangrove species, especially the Rhizophora mucronata. This is the past projection, that is the Middle Holocene time span projection. And here we see a rise in the extreme. Only the current projection. Oh, like it's again not changing. I'll change it to that one. Uh, is it fine now? Past projection? Yes, yes. No. Okay, so this is for Avicenia officinalis, and uh, here we see an increase in the highly suitable habitat uh, in the in the Pichavram area, in the Kerala coast, and also along the Maharashtra coast. Whereas there is a decline in the uh, there is not much su highly suitable habitat in the Sundarbans area. Coming to the future projection, in 2050, we see a drastic decline in the extremely suitable as well as highly suitable habitat. This is for RCP 8.5, where it is say, it is said that it, during the 21st century, there would be a, a throughout increase in the GHG greenhouse gas emissions and the temperature would rise in 21st century around five degrees Celsius, which is the worst case of climate change scenario in future. And here we see only moderately suitable habitat found in the in the Koringa area and also in Sundarbans in some parts in patches, whereas low suitable habitat will also decline from the southern part of India. And then coming to 2070 here in Officinalis, we see uh, again a decline in the extremely suitable habitat. 
with low suitable habitats in other parts of India and moderately suitable habitats in Sundarbans, Chilika, that is the Mahanadi Delta, and, uh, uh, and in the Dwaraka coast. So um, this is how we have projected the mangrove habitat in current and future climate scenarios, which shows a decrease, which indicates high vulnerability of the species to climate change impacts. And these mangrove species are projected to, uh, to, projected to shift in their ranges in future with a decrease in the suitable coastal areas, which was available to them in the Indian coastline. And with that, we see that Pichavaram, Muthupet, Kuringa, Krishna mangroves, and the Kokan Kerala coast mangroves have forecasted to see severe decline with a complete loss of stable habitats. Whereas Sundarbans, Bhitakarnika, Mahanadi mangroves, along with Chilika, would be conserving both the mangrove species in the low and moderately suitable habitat along the east coast of India. Whereas Dwarika coast also in the Gujarat uh, along the west coast will also be targeted as an area of mangrove biodiversity conservation during the anticipated future climate change scenario. Our findings will assist in formulating species specific restoration plans for mangroves in context to climate change in the Indian subcontinent. Thank you. Thank you, Jyoti. And uh, we have one minute for quick questions if, yes. if there are any. Uh, Krishna yes, Murthy, ma'am. Ma Anupma, ma'am. Yeah, Jyoti. Uh, yes, ma'am. That's a nice presentation. Thank you. Thanks, um, I'm I'm just curious why you used uh, a lot of factors except you know the sea level and also the um, salinity, which are the most important for uh, yes, uh, species. True, so, ma'am. I agree with that. And ma'am, this is the next step of this analysis. This is the initial stage. So we have only taken the environmental variables. And now we have to collect the database for sea level changes and salinity. And surely we will be adding that in the future uh, study. This is the first stage of that study. And yes, we required the salinity and the uh, sea level change data also. So, the amount the data collection is time taking, and that is also uh, like we are lacking in that. Okay. Yes, yes ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, Rajesh? And yes. I have a just uh, added question here, Jyoti, yes. uh, because part of my question, Adhumaj has already asked. Uh, my question is uh, let us say, with your projections, whether they are right or wrong, that is a different thing. But uh, uh, what kind of carbon uh, capture is taking place because of these mangrove areas where you are working on and if you have because you are now talking about the modeling studies if you kind of preserve these mangroves where you have shown the hotspots how much carbon uh, you can sequester by 2070 any angle uh so if we are able to conserve these mangrove habitats definitely carbon sequestration will be enhanced in these areas but main problem is the conservation part like uh, in uh, as we know we are from developing countries the response capacity is very low like uh, we still have to make that awareness done so yes it will be enhanced i can't tell the figures but it will definitely be enhanced as mangroves are the main components for carbon sequestration especially in the coastal areas so definitely, if we are conserving that, then it will be done. Otherwise, there will be a loss. I think in coastal areas, what Anupma ji is saying, I am seconding to it, but it is my prime concern rather than the climate. I think the seawater yes, intrusions yes, are mainly take, I mean, the real causes. Uh, exactly, yeah. sir. Actually, this is only the first half of the study, and we wanted to include salinity and sea level change. But this data compilation is very time consuming, and we are going to add in the final studies the salinity and the sea level change. Actually, getting the data from various databases, like soil grids, is the database from where we have to extract the salinity data, sediment salinity, pH data, and uh, Definitely, we'll be adding that to the study because for coastal areas, this is of prime importance. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, with this, I close the session. I mean, the session has been a wonderful session, time we spent, and all the speakers largely kept the time.
and i'm sorry for a couple of speakers that that i have to stop in between uh if any one of the seniors want to comment anything i would request remarks from them or else i'll suggest i'll ask rajesh to please uh, summarize of you if you want to add anything to the session rajesh okay uh, thank you pradeep um, i think uh, this session was wonderful and it had uh, many aspects at, as we have uh, seen right from i mean the keynote address from professor bob wasson and then as her uh, we went to the south pole and uh, we talked about the tropical area vulnerabilities and also i mean um, some some time i just feel it is my submission that time was little less otherwise this uh, kundal uh, dr kundal's talk was also very nice actually i was trying to get into it but not enough time was there but overall i think um, everybody would agree that uh, all the people could present um, uh, very well within time uh, 10 minute time is short i know and uh, i think uh, we uh, i from my own behalf and vsip behalf congratulate organizers of uh, iqc for having this wonderful session thank you very much thank you thank you rajesh and we'll definitely find some time else somewhere sometime to invite the speakers who could not speak i mean who yes. could not present their full talk yeah that is what i was thinking so thank you over to you vinita now uh thank you pradeep thank you uh, rajesh for conducting the session so well so we break down for lunch uh, it's a break coffee break or uh, the lunch break but we meet uh, as uh, in half an hour that is 1:30 with the poster session so we have 18 uh, very interesting poster and i request the poster presenters to be there and we would be screening the posters from here and uh, they get 5 5 minutes to you know talk on that so uh, just prepare it as a concise uh, you know talk uh, because there we are having all the more less time so uh, because we had such a overwhelming response for this uh, ICC 2022 there were so many more than 90 you know uh, abstracts that we received you must have seen the abstract volume so it's very hard to you know accommodate everything but and we wanted to listen to all of you so uh i i i hope you uh you understand what our situation as organizers was here so uh thank you once again i hope you had a wonderful uh, you know morning session and uh, we'll meet again for a yet interesting poster session in the afternoon just after lunch thank you so the link will be open and uh, we'll stop recording from here and uh, at uh, 1 uh, 20 maybe the link will be open so please join again and uh, you can keep joining also Thank you. Bye bye.